Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got some feedback from last week, a couple of news links, including a blog from ArenaNet, and a big old roundtable on how to stream and record content for Guild Wars 2. Stay tuned, it's coming right up. Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tira. Tir Tales of Tiros? <laughs> wow! I was doing so well today! Hello everybody, and welcome to Tales of Tyria, episode number 37. I am Bridger, I'll be your host for this evening. We are almost live from... Actually, we're still almost live from the mist, because I forgot to change it. So, why don't we just stay here, because that's where you're going to be using most of your streaming anyway. Uh, so, we are uh, glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two or three, won't you? That would be fantastic. Uh, now, I'd like to remind everybody, before we go any further, uh, if you could... If you, let, let, me, let me rephrase that, not if you could, but if you enjoy the program to the point where you think you would want to, let me just remind you to subscribe on YouTube if you're watching it right now. We are almost at 5,000 subscribers and that is the magic number to where we can maybe get some more uh, partnership tools to where we can actually format the show and make it easier to find things because they give you a lot cooler tools to make shows and episodic content when you get to uh, uh, be partners. So anyway, uh, that would help us out a lot. Also, just want to remind everybody right up front, feedback at talesoftyria.com is how you can get a hold of us. So if you have any questions, comments, or any, anything that you want to share, go ahead and send it there. Or follow us on Twitter. It's at Tales of Tyria. That's how you keep up to date with us right now. Let me introduce everyone else on the show here. Uh, we have a brand newcomer to the show, also from Team Legacy. You may know him from his League of Legends casting after the show. It is Idrops. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, everybody. Long-time listener, first-time co-host. Happy to be here. Now, you may think of yourself, you're looking at the screen going, Bridger switched to the wrong thing. It's a video. I think he's, he's got the wrong one. No, friends, that is iDrops. iDrops is a talking MPEG file, uh, just in case you didn't know. And he's <laughs> also a socially now. awkward penguin. He doesn't have a webcam. Maybe that's <laughs> what you are aware of. So he is controlling it with his stream on the other end. It's streamception, everybody. It's so, yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about streaming. So that's why I'm here, here to provide my expert opinion on how things work. All right, absolutely. And also, uh, a very <laughs> high-quality uh, streamer from Team Legacy. Welcome, Oku, who is also streamceptioning us right now with his awesome background. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I'm really, I don't know if I'm a good streamer, but if Hedrops is here, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And lastly, Freelancer, the, the one, the only, the legend, the one who is streaming all weekend long. I think I checked your stream. No, maybe it was iDrop stream. They had like 20 hours of streams from the last beta weekend event. It was ridiculous. But uh, yeah, you, you're the one that taught me everything I know about this. So I'm glad to have you on here. Well, I appreciate it, Bridger. <laughs> yeah, I, I streamed all weekend long. Uh, me and I dropped both. Quite a few people, Solstice, etc. Uh, we had a lot of good streamers. All right. And yeah, it's certainly not going to take away from, from everybody else that was streaming that had to do with Team Legacy. This is just the ones that came up on top of the head, and we're all able to make it at the same time. So that's the idea here. And apparently now I'm in Ghost of Ascalon. So that's just, we're just going to keep bouncing back and forth between <laughs> the ghosts attacking and the mists. I think that's going to be how we do it here. So um, let us get right into it. Last week, we actually asked you guys to respond and we're going to actually do this every week i think it's a really cool little thing that we can do to to get your feedback in an easy uh to to see way and this is something that we can visualize and show on the next show so everybody can see what's going on so uh every week we're going to be asking a question of our audience and we're going to put a poll up on the team legacy website because that's just it's got a poll interface so why not it's right there so uh you can go in and register and we had 39 people cast last week but hopefully now that you know go to talesofteria.com 
forum and click on the, the link that's on the post there or any of the forum posts that I make. Uh, you should find the link there or in the show notes itself if you're watching this on YouTube. You can respond to these. So last week we asked, how much time will you spend in structured PvP at release? There were actually three people that said no, none. So apparently they, they slogged through last week's show just like, oh, tell me about dragons. Gosh, this is ridiculous. And then they perked up when they heard us talk about Svanir for a little while, because that's PvE. Uh, but <laughs> I guess they just not in that interested. But that's okay, because we're doing PvP and PvE on this show. Last week just happened to be a PvP-centric show. Anyway. We had the most people interested in going to structured PvP about 26 to 50 percent of the time, and and a couple of people, five people, said basically 100 percent of the time. Uh, so that's that's a pretty interesting breakdown of our of our audience from last week. But yeah, I expect it to be in there somewhere. I'll probably be in the 26 to 50 percent uh, range myself. Uh, what about you, Oku? Um, you know, I think structured is a it's a really great way to practice. You know, my focus is on Warbur's World, but um, in Warbur's World. You know, you don't have the chance to have those uh, sort of small, small-scale battles as often as you might uh, in structured. I think it's a really good way to practice. Um, you know, I probably won't be spending the, mo the majority of my time in there because I'll be focused on WordPress World, but I definitely think it's, it should be required as a, you know, a way to practice for people. And, all, and of course, uh, you know, to test out new builds and things like that. Absolutely. Uh, Freelancer, what are you thinking? How much time are you spending in structured? Uh, come live or BWE? I've just come live. That, that was the question is how much time will you spend in structured PvP at release? Uh, it depends. Um, I look at it like uh, my main focus, just because my guild looks to me to do it, is to be out in Worldly World leading the raid. Um, but I'm still a very, uh, very capable structured PvP player. I've had, I, I like to think I have a ton of skill in structured arena combat. So I'm going to be out there just as much. I, I even though I love Worldly World, I'm going to be out there, and I and the guild will be out there. I still tell my guild members even now that you're not going to learn anything as far as developing player skill out in Worldly World. You should be in structured PvP. So, if we're uh, if we're not doing Worldly World, I encourage everybody to go out there and follow me into structured PvP because that's where you're going to learn to be a better player. Absolutely. I mean, there the, the, you get two two different things out of World versus World versus structured PvP. World versus World has that epic, you know organizational uh, thing where, where you feel satisfied when you come together as a group and accomplish something bigger than yourself, right? That's one of the things that games can do really well, and that's what uh, makes Guild Wars 2 so special is how it does it so well in World vs. World. Mm -hmm. But uh, Structured PvP has an entirely different Part, kind of satisfaction, essentially, that has to do with how you know improving your own self, uh, you know, and not relying on a large organization, but instead relying on yourself and four other people, and that's it. So, right. eye drops. What about you? How much are you spending in uh, in the world versus world? Well, I mean, in uh, structured PvP. Yeah. Well, I think for me, as being you know one of the official casters for Team Legacy, it's really important for me to get in there and uh, really get to know like the different strategies. <laughs> Pay no attention to the penguin, but <laughs> to know you know the intricate strategies, things like that, to to where I can really know when I'm casting the the information to all the audience that I really you know know what I'm talking about. That's really important. So I'd probably say around you know roughly 30 to 40 percent of my free time that's not spent in World vs. World is is going to be devoted just to uh, hanging out with the SPVP guys and you know getting to know the the whole scene. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I'm I'm kind of falling in in that range too because I, I I like freelancer. I love the world versus world, and I'm also going to be spending a lot of time in PVE because I like the. <laughs> I never did it in World of Warcraft because I never could get immersed in World of Warcraft. I literally would have a podcast on while I was grinding through PVE in World of Warcraft because I there was I couldn't imagine myself there. The world was so static and so dopey. Like, oh, there's 16 centaurs in a field. I mean, we've gone over this all before. But when I'm playing Guild Wars 2, like in these beta weekend events, when I like muted TeamSpeak for a while, it was actually a little bit better because I could pay attention to all the little things. Speaking of the little things, uh, that's the next piece of our news here. Uh, and this is actually a video by somebody that we've had on here before. He talked about the dynamic events, and you may recognize his voice. He's got a very distinctive accent. So specifically, he's talking about the very small details, like, for example, this wolf is one of the things he's giving an example. It doesn't just stand there statically. 
it has a many it has like a minute's worth of different animations so that if you're not sitting there watching it for a very extended period of time it it doesn't get old it doesn't look like a piece of art it looks like a living breathing world and he goes on to talk about a lot more things and show like uh, how the characters move and the fact that sound is different when you're running through uh, small water versus big water not small water shallow water versus deeper water when you can run through it it's, it's all the little things so highly recommend you check out this video he talks about how splashing is different when you fall from a great height and a small height all the little things they actually really do matter as far as immersiveness in my immersion so highly recommend you check that out the link is in the show notes which you can find at talesofteria.com or you can find it in the description if you're watching this video on youtube now uh, that brings us to the blog post from this weekend. You guys read the blog post from this weekend? Mm. Sorry, not Which weekend. One Last week, the, the Is It Fun blog post. Oh, yes, yes. Right, yeah. A anybody want to run us through what, what exactly was that really getting down to? Go for it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the blog post, Is It Fun? Basically, for all intents and purposes, I, I highly recommend you check this out and read it yourself, but bringing it down into the Cliff Notes edition, Colin says, you've got a business model in these other MMOs, and it's all about how many subscribers you have, because that's how your money. So you can measure your success as a development studio, as a game maker, based on how many subscribers you have, because that's how you're making money. But if you don't have subscribers, how do you set a met metric of success? You know, in, a, in Grand Theft Auto, how many units did it sell? In World of Warcraft, how many subscribers are there? Those are both monetary measures of success. But you can't necessarily do that in Guild Wars 2. I mean, you can't say, okay, it sold this much based on the hype, but how many people actually stuck around to play it, that matters. How many people are still buying it, that matters. And they said their metric for success, is it fun? That's what they really asked themselves. What, what they, and they basically re-emphasized that to all of their testers everywhere and said, every time you're playing, ask yourself, is it fun? Why is it fun? And 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 in what and are you if you're not having fun why aren't you having fun and try to give that feedback to the developers in exactly that particular way not just this is broken because I can't get to the next part but this isn't fun and it's because of this or this is fun and it's because of that so so it's a very interesting article and if you like game design like I do I highly recommend you check it out uh, is there anything that you, that stuck out to you uh, when you're reading this guys that that you think is worth uh, specifically talking about not so much the content but reading over that article i remember catching that a, a couple days ago it's just it's amazing that um you have development studios like this that are putting out blog posts like this i mm -hmm. mean have you ever seen blizzard go out and explain on on how their business model works and how they determine success because i haven't ever read one you know um it, it's very different i i guess there's a certain there's something special about the fact that arena net is so glass door or glass wall with how yeah. they're developing the game it's so, because they're not you know, embarrassed by what they're doing well right? all right you know like how long ago did we start this podcast i mean would you have honestly uh waited this long for a game that where they didn't have this information coming out like this bridger probably not you know you you wouldn't have cared you wouldn't have uh, after a couple months of getting excited about it that would have been it you would have yeah. forgot about it yeah it's yeah, because of these blog posts that are coming out that we're all you know that we're all still very much entrenched you know and and still very much excited about the game and just when we start to have that lull moment get back into like league of legends you know <laughs> uh you know another blog post comes out and we all get excited about it again so it's pretty cool i, don't, I haven't seen many companies do that it's true it's true all right so anyway i don't i don't want to go over everything in here because it was actually a really cool article and i think it's mm -hmm. worth checking out on your own so i will uh again its link is in the show notes so go ahead and check that out oku Disappearing Hello? off the stream. Hello. <laughs> it said you went offline and then you came back, but I'm lost your down. video. There it is. He's he's coming back. All right, I, it's it's loading in. So, uh, I guess at this point there wasn't a whole lot more that I noticed. I mean, there was a, and, it, and it's probably worth mentioning. It's not that I missed it. I know there was a there was some leaks on on Reddit or 4chan or wherever they came from. I think there might have been some screen. I think that well there was some screenshots of like the Silvari zone. There was some some rips from the DAT file where people were looking at weapons and stuff. And yeah, it's cool. It's just. Why aren't we talking about it? There's nothing to discuss there. Most of the, the things that they put on there were, were balance changes, and to me, uh, we're so f far from release that I just don't care about balance changes. It just doesn't seem like right. it makes a big deal to me. Because anything we talk about right now with balance, like if we got into it and said, oh, I can't believe what they're changing the warrior here, that's, that's a problem. 
two months later, we're going to completely forget we had that conversation because maybe the Warriors completely changed back or changed in another way. It's still changing at a very fast pace, as we saw between beta weekend number one and beta weekend number two. So that's why we're not really talking about it. So you, you might find some, some people talking about it in other podcasts. We're not going to talk about it here. Just doesn't doesn't make sense to me. Now, if the patch notes said added dragon attack on Divinity's Reach or something, <laughs> I would love to talk about that and like, oh, what could that mean and speculate. But if they're mostly balance changes, it doesn't mean that much to me. So there, there might actually be a reason to go to Divinity's Reach then. <laughs> oh snap! Actually, I was gonna make a I was gonna make a post about that. I was kind of worried because I see everything coalescing in Lion's Arch. Like that's where the world versus world portals are. Right. It's got right. all the crafting nope. stations. It's got all of the the like the Derman Priory and and the, and the Vigil and the Order of Whispers where you have to go to complete your story. Except Mystic for your Forge. personal. And, yep. the, and there you go, Mystic Forge. You can't go back and craft in Divinity's Reach or the Black Citadel or Holbrecker or the Grove, etc. Or Radasum. I should probably throw that in there, not just etc. Because then all the Asura are going to call me a Buka. <laughs> so it's, it's I don't know, is are, are they going to be ghost towns except for Lion's Arch? Yeah, I think actually it's... that's what you're going to run into. Um, it, I mean, the, the towns are alive no matter if you're there or not. But... Generally, pe generally speaking, people want to be around other people, and they're going to go to where they have the uh, most things to do in the smallest area, and generally that's the capital cities. Like, uh, I know we don't talk about WoW or anything like that, but people tend to be in Orgrimmar all the time, for example. You know, mm -hmm. I think Lion's Arch is going to be the exact same thing, especially putting those specialty items and crafting stations only in Lion's Arch and those portals. Uh, that's where you're going to see everybody pretty much uh, you know, congregating. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think a, a big difference with WoW, obviously, is that you have the uh, the trade trade channels and things like that. I don't know if, you know, that type of thing will be present in Guild Wars 2, but, um, I mean, just the presence of the Mystic Forge, I think, will, will you know, collect people in Lion's Arch. Yeah, Yeah. well, you had similar things in, um, in WoW, you know, everybody be pre, uh, uh, what was it? I guess it was Wrath of the Lich King, um, would congregate in Iron Forge and Stormwind, um, because... It, to a player that's just looking for making quick sales and getting out, the auction house was very near to the bank in those areas. Mm. Um, you know, and that was a very real thing. In Lion's Arch, it's not so close. You sort of have to run past that central area, but um, you can use the waypoint, get between your bank and auction house there really fast. Now, in Divinity's Reach, you have to run a good 30 seconds to get between your, your bank access and your, um, uh, your auction house there, or your trading post, sorry. Um, it's They're going to have to... I think the way you know what the, what's going to happen with Divinity's Reach and the other cities when we see them is um, they're going to turn into like a dollar run um, and basically be sort of the place you go to because it looks nice or uh, what's uh, what's the name of this Darnassus? There you go. That's the one I meant to say um, <laughs> from WoW. Where who may who went to Darnassus? <laughs> I mean, unless you started in the Night Elf area and WoW, you oh, Darnassus yeah. was just a pretty it was city. So you didn't, far you know, out. There's a reason that Ogrimmar was like the place to be. It's because it was like so centralized in mm -hmm. in Kalimdor, except for like the far like southern areas, like Tenaris and those higher level areas. But like winter, wasn't there some higher level areas in like the northeast of of Kalimdor? That that whole area there, that when people were were max level, they were going up in those areas and and fighting the World Tree and things like that. At least when Cataclysm happened. Anyway, uh, this isn't Panda Podcast, so yeah. um, <laughs> we got off on a wrong tangent. I I would have loved to have seen, though, like, if each of the cities, each of the capitals, like, specialized in something. Yeah. Like, if Divinity's yeah. Reach specialized in crafting, and Lion's Arch specialized in World vs. World, and, you know, and, and Holbrecht specialized in PvP. Like, take all the cool stuff in the mists and, like, put it in a section of Holbrecht. Like, this is way too late to do all that, but that way you'd have themed capital cities where one is all about lore and researching, like, I don't know, Silvari or Asura could kind of be like that, and another one is all about world versus world, and you can you have all what? world versus world associated things in it. You know what Divinity's Reach could be for, Bridger? All right, you got, like, all the sections of different parts of the city mm. that all have their sort of theme going to them. What if you imagine that be sort of instanced areas for guild halls? Oh, and yeah. player housing, and only I guess I could dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 
everybody's going to be demanding it. We might see it in like an expansion. <laughs> that might be a big. Like, like, how many things can you like put out an expansion besides like new areas to where you can say we've got a brand new feature? Like guild halls is a huge new feature that if you do it right can be a big attractive thing that could bring people back to play the game again. But anyway, I digress. Uh, let's <laughs> let's let's finish uh, by mentioning one more thing before we get into the roundtable, and that is this nifty Tales of Tyria mug. My, uh, my wife got it for me, actually, for my birthday. She set up a Cafe Press account, and she had access to all of my graphics because she helped make some of them. So she, like, surprised me, like, by giving me the present. I was like, oh, what's this? And it's Tales of Tyria mug. Well, that's awesome. And some other people <laughs> saw it last week on the show, and they're like, hey, can I get that? And I was like... I don't know. Hey, can they get that? And she was like, oh, yeah, totally. So there's a link to it in the show notes. It's right at the beginning in the show intro because that's where I was going to talk about it, and then I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so now here we are. So it's the Tales of Tyria Cafe Press Store, and actually there's a lot more than just a mug there. Uh, you, can, you can see for yourself they got T-shirts. Some of them are really weird. It's like a, a white square on a black T-shirt. But, you know, that's just... I think she just went with, like, the basic package and they stuck the same image on everything. So if you want to look like a very, uh, you know, a business-like, like, casual business, you could go for the golf <laughs> shirt, you know? You, you could go for that because it's got just a little giant logo up here in the chest area. And then uh, they've got a green one for some reason. Okay, that's cool. you got water bottles if you ever wanted to show your Tales of Tyria pride with water. There you go. You got to stay green. <laughs> Tote bag. Um, a logo apron or a shot glass. Okay, so there, there's a little. Cr and I don't understand the calendar because it's the same image on every single month. Or no, no, this is a year calendar, so it's a single image in a single, a single set of months. Okay. I you see. should do. You should do something like uh, once you get once we're in the next beta weekend, like make a bunch of female like humans and uh, make them all look different and then take screenshots of them and send them in for your calendar. Uh, I don't know if the internet would get on us for that. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> like the women of Guild Wars. <laughs> yeah, we've Why been, uh, Team Legacy has been using our Cafe Press account uh, very successfully. It's, they oh, make yeah. some good, high-quality stuff, especially the T-shirts that you guys are wearing. Uh, you could show off right now, but uh, um, that all came from that. But, I mean, you got to admit, those shirts are nice. Yeah, the, they the are. Material the quality is definitely um, really good. I got yep. cat hair all over mine, though. I'm very sorry, freelancer. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, Overseer Kitty gets back at me with <laughs> white cat hair everywhere, so I know how it is. We have a white and black cat. I can't win no matter what I wear. <laughs> it sheds white and black hair. Way off on a tangent here. Whoa, rain it in. <laughs> rain it in. Okay, let's get back onto the round table, ladies and gentlemen, because today we are talking about streaming and recording and creating content for Guild Wars 2, but mo mostly focused on streaming and recording uh, Guild Wars 2 gameplay, because it's not something that you can just pick up and do. The game doesn't come with tools that just let you, yeah, here, push a button and stream. So it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So I think we're, we should probably take a moment to talk about it. And so we're going to start with the streaming section, because that's what I think probably most people want to do with, with it, but we'll also cover recording things with Fraps, for example, and doing post-production to, to put up on, uh, on, on YouTube, for example, if you want to create videos to go there. Not entirely unlike our, our Golem video that I put up or, or the uh, Dreaming Bay video. So let me put this number in here. Yes, indeed. So streaming. Let's talk first hardware requirements, because if you don't have the right hardware, it doesn't matter if you want to stream because you won't be able to. Right? So, Freelancer, you, you kind of gave a, a good rundown in our hardware episode. I put what I thought was the recommendations here in the show notes. Are these, a, you know, go over these and tell me if these are right or not. I'll correct myself if, uh, if, okay. if, if I'll try I'm to, I'll try to make this quick. Um, hardware is the most, the most important piece of hardware, obviously, is your CPU. You guys check out the show notes there. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you can see a couple of our uh, more common recommendations. But the reason the CPU is probably the most important thing is because when you are streaming at, at any given time, it's encoding, and the encoding process uh, before it even gets sent to the internet uh, is very taxing on your CPU. Your, your CPU does all of that work, and uh, it uh, can heat up your system in a heartbeat. And Those that stream and record fraps know very well that their systems get very hot, the room gets very hot. So you, it's very important also with the CPU um, by the way, currently we recommend the 2500K Sandy Bridge. Um, but with that Sandy Bridge, we recommend a really good heat sink. You can't go with just the, you know, the stock heat sink. It just doesn't cut it. Um, it will, it will 
do okay if you have like a box fan that's sitting next to your your PC. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I always recommend everybody. I mean, go out, get yourself a little twenty dollar, uh, you know, Hyper Two Twelve cooler. I mean, it's the best, highest rated cooler out there, and it's twenty bucks. I mean, there's no reason not to grab one of those. Yeah. But besides that, cooling's really important. Um, you got to have uh, intake X, you know, um, going. You got to have uh, fans bringing air in and fans bringing air out. A lot of people make the mistake of putting a bunch of case uh, case fans on, and I guarantee half the audience now and probably half of those listening uh you have this very problem right now you have so many case fans and i say so many we'll say three or four case fans that you added on thinking oh man i'm drawing in so much more air it's it's nice and it's going to cool it off but for every case fan you're adding on you're actually heating up your system and you don't even realize it because most people that put case fans on they put them on and they put them on to draw air in and you create this positive pressure environment that doesn't allow air to escape fast enough um, the optimal way to do it is to actually, uh, on the front of your case or on the side panel, put fans that actually bring air in. And then on the top, I'm looking at my PC now, but on the top and the back end, if you have the space f uh, for it, you want the equivalent CFM, which is cubic uh, feet of per minute, the, the output of air. And the fans have these ratings on them. You want an equivalent uh, shooting the air back out, so you create this wind tunnel effect. Most people, unfortunately, um, most people I help out, the Guild, etc., they put all these case fans on to have an issue with it. So check that out. I think uh, most people realize, oh, mate, yeah, I do have too many fans pushing air in. Reverse sub, uh, reverse couple of ones in the back, and you'll be amazed. Go Moving on, you got, um, obviously, RAM. You're going to want at least... Um, 16 is a little overkill for most people. It really depends on what you're doing. If you're just playing Guild Wars 2, you're just streaming or you're just recording for apps, don't get yourself eight, more than 8 gig because everybody's like, oh, 16 gig, you know, that's that's what you need. They don't know what they're talking about. Tell them to just, just shut up. You know, you don't need 16 gig of RAM. Get 8 gig of RAM, at least 1600 megahertz, you're plenty fine. Guild Wars 2, um, a little numbers for you guys. Guild Wars 2, when we all control deleted and looked at the resource usage, this is basically an unoptimized game. It was drawing about 3 to 4 gigs of memory. So if you have 8 gig of RAM, X split, uh, whatever fraps, whatever you're using, doesn't use but maybe 500 meg of RAM. So right there, it, you would almost guess that 6 gig of RAM, assuming you're not doing anything else, is plenty enough. Um, besides that, bandwidth. This is a really touchy subject. Most people that want to get into streaming, they, they do a speed test and they're like, well, I only have 1 meg upload. Well, stop right there. I'm sorry, this, this, uh, this little Good tangent point. we're all... This little tangent we're all going on here is, is not for you. You're not going to be able to stream uh, a decent enough quality with a one meg upload. Not because you can't, but because the, the connection usually on a one meg upload connection, whether it's DSL or otherwise, is not stable enough to provide a steady frame rate and a steady bit rate. Uh, we'll get into that later. But uh, if you can, try to get more than one meg. We recommend, uh, like in show notes there, at least two to three meg. Uh, most cable connections can, can get that. Um, a lot of times you can call the cable provider and they can just flip a switch literally and get you a little bit extra upload. Um, it's it, you got to have it. I mean that's that's what people look at. Um, without that, you can't get 720 480p out. Uh, last couple things, monitors. Um, Bridger, you just recently got a second monitor, right? I did. Or you've had one. Mm -hmm. No, when 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 we started doing the show. Uh, episode three, when we started doing the show in video, I was borrowing my wife's monitor to do the show every week, and after a while, she got so fed up that she let me buy another one so that I didn't have to keep moving things around all the time. And it, oh man, it's night and day. I mean, it's it's right. so much better yeah. when you can see and interact with your audience, and you can see exactly what's going out on your stream. Like it, like when we're yep. playing League of Legends, I sometimes forget to change it from one scene to another, and yeah. seeing it on the second monitor is so useful. Yeah. See, presentation is everything. Uh, for you guys wondering, why do I need a second monitor? You know, that's like extra two hundred dollars just to stream. Well, it does a lot more than that. Most most of the more you know apt gamers that have, that they they game. You know, this is their way of just relaxing. They will have a second monitor for more than just streaming. You can put your spreadsheets up. Like I always put my spreadsheets right over here. <laughs> Sorry, and uh, I'm, I'm not waving here. in front of the cam there, but like all my spreadsheets and stuff are over here. But aside from that, when you're streaming. Um, it allows you to put all of your stuff that you don't want to alt tab and show people on the stream on that screen. Mm -hmm. You can keep your game on this stream and you don't have to intersect the two. It, it keeps it nice and clean. Um, last couple things, obviously webcam. You got to have a decent webcam. 
Um, right now, I'm using the Logitech. Uh, it's like something 900 HD series. Bridger, which one do you use? Uh, hang on. Let me stare at mine and look like a doof. Uh, the Logitech <laughs> Carl Zeitz Tesser? Is that That's a thing? Lens. That's, That's a lens. Okay, well, I don't know what I'm using then. It's it's. Yeah. <laughs> I have to look it up. It's it's one yeah. of the ones that you recommended to me. It's the 1080p one. Right. Yeah, you're using the HD cam. Um, you know, you can get a decent webcam like we all use on Tales of Teria for, you know, and decent is is plenty of fine. Uh, 480p, 720. And you can get one for like 40 bucks. Um, it's yeah, you, it's not bad at all. I mean, I got HD, but you don't need it specifically because. No, you don't. If you're streaming, you're going to be compressing that video anyway to a much smaller format. Like at least 720p is like, even if you're streaming really well, 720p is usually where most people tap out at in terms of bandwidth. So you're really not going to need an HD. I got it because I'm trying to do like a real professional setup and I'm worried about the future and all that stuff. But 720p, <clears throat> absolutely, you know, superb performance quality. You can even get a little bit less than that if, if, you're, if you're just sort of dabbling. But yeah. Right. And then uh, lastly, as we all know, quality headset microphone. Now, uh, I got to ask, uh, let me just spin it up and get one of the other guys talking here. Eye drops, what do you consider quality? What is a quality headset to you? Uh, a headset? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I currently have one of a uh, headset that's pretty much identical to yours. I think you have the step up. I'm using the PC350, the right, Sennheiser. Right. Uh, yeah. I got it there on the screen. Um, it's a fantastic all-around headset. I think it's right around 200 bucks, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. Throw me a uh, link when you get a chance. I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, sure. Yeah, I definitely will do that. Um, basically, the sound quality is really nice. So for an all-in-one kind of setup, um, those Sennheisers, we definitely suggest those. Uh, they're fantastic products. But as far as casting goes, for me, the, the mic is much more important. Um, I could care less about the, the, the sound while I'm casting. And frankly, I don't even like the sound of my own voice. So... The worse, the better. But anyways, um, I use earbuds when I'm casting and then a, a standard condenser microphone, like a studio condenser mic. I have a, a picture here of it on the, uh, the that screen. That looks so much cooler than mine. Uh, yeah, and just on a standard boom. And basically, it's, it's, uh, this one's right around $230, but you have to keep in mind that it's also uh, just a microphone. So you have to have something else to hear yourself with. Um, like I said, I just use a, a standard, some iPod earbuds to listen to myself but uh, microphone as far as I'm concerned a quality microphone is uh, you got to go you got to go gotta have your mic yep yeah if you're gonna get anything get yourself a good mic because uh, you know first off it's got to be directional most people go to Walmart and they get you know one of those Logitech cheapo mics um, or use you got the one on their sure webcam that's or a no the, also or the webcam one uh, you know the problem with those is not so much the quality I mean most I say most. So most people probably won't tell the difference. But if somebody walks in, you know, to my room right now, if my wife walks in or overseer kitty knocks over something behind the webcam right now, you guys will have no idea it happened. And that's because it's a directional mic that I have. Um, you know, it's it's important when you're streaming that people do not hear the loud noises and the cars beeping outside and, and whatever it might be. It's it's just a uh, just being professional about it, keeping everything nice and fluid. People don't want to hear that. And um, yeah, it, it goes with the presentation. Yeah, and, and if you're going to get a headset, I mean, like we said, sometimes the things not to get, let's put it this way, not using the microphone on your webcam, not using one of those, like, desktop microphones that, like, has a little stand that comes up towards you, uh, and, and not using any headset that's, like, $20 or less. Like, go to at least 30 or $40, and any of those above that range are going to have a decent right. microphone. The ones yeah, that see, are higher up might have a slightly better one, but 30 or 40 is, like, the minimum you want to go. And, and that's a big, big problem. Um, you know, I kind of went into that other hardware episode, like... Uh, you know, this is a Sennheiser set. This this will pro probably ram me 200 something plus dollars. I don't remember. I got it a month ago. Um, but people buy headsets like these expecting like this insane, you know, audio quality and that it has an incredible mic and it'll just sound better. It, it works in tandem with your sound card. Like I also have a, a Zonar Essence sound card, which is a $200 sound card. Um, it's you know, it goes hand in hand. I would I would not be able to push these to the limits they are without having a headset amplifier built into that uh, sound card. So don't go out and buy you know a Sennheiser headset if you're not going to power it with a decent sound card. Just the same, if, if you're going to buy a nice sound card, get yourself a nice headset so you can hear those highs and lows. You know, when an explosion goes off or a trebuchet launches, for me, you know, it is a very clear and visible or 
audio, or let me spit that out right, <laughs> um, a very, uh, it, there's just a huge difference when I put my headset on or like when my wife comes in with her little earphones and we hook it up to the same computer. It, you know, it's just a booming noise that you feel with a much higher quality headset. And it's not for everybody. I mean, most people are going to be like, oh, that's $400, you know, what the heck, you know? Well, I also don't need three monitors, you know? So it, it is, it, it is yeah. what it is. Everybody has their sort of forte that they enjoy. This is what I enjoy. Get what you want. Most people, if you had to make a decision, get yourself a better graphics card. Don't spend the money on a super nice headset. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, that's and, the way and, I tell everybody. Speaking of graphics cards, we yep. did, we didn't really touch on it, but I do have some links in the show notes. So if you're if you're worried about what I put in there is like a GTX 460 or better, or the Radeon equivalent would be a 6850 or a 770, 7, right. 7770. And there's a really good link on there, and I'll pop it up on the oh my gosh ads. Uh, I'll pop it up on the uh, on the show here so that you guys can see it. This is an awesome tool. And I think they put out one of these every once in a while that shows you a hierarchy chart of what, because the cards have such weird names and numbers and they don't always go in ascending order. So this is really useful for you to get an idea of what kind of uh, uh, like uh, Radeon versus, you know, G uh, NVIDIA cards are on the same level in terms of quality and things like that. So highly recommend you check that out if you're looking for a new video card uh, and, and that use that as your guide. So sorry. And, uh, uh and well, and finishing up the topic on headset mics, um, somebody brought up a very good thing that we didn't really cover in that hardware episode. I'll just kind of make one note on it. Um, these 5.1 USB headset, or USB headsets in general. I'm going to tell you guys straight. This is how pretty much how any gamer, how if you go to an event, how they look at it. USB headsets are beautiful for lands for going out to tournaments, etc. Whenever I go out somewhere, I used to go out to scenes pretty often uh, back when I played Counter-Strike. USB head, you can't beat a USB headset because there's no setup required. You don't have to plug it into the right audio jacks and get the right drivers for it. You literally plug it in, Windows picks it up, installs the default Windows drivers for it, and it works. It doesn't matter what PC you're on. Because mm -hmm. a lot of those events, when you go there, they have PCs there for you. You're not allowed to necessarily bring your own. And it, you could just hook up your own set. Um, now, with USB headsets, though, the problem with those is you can only get so much power out of a USB uh, port. So USB 2.0, 3.0, et cetera, there's only so much voltage they can put out and amperage that they can send to your headset. So they're not, uh, as far as audio, they're not as, they don't have the fidelity of a uh, 3.5 or, um, or whatever kind of jack you have, like a regular a headset. But you know it's for convenience. So if you're if you're just deciding if you're on the fence between getting a uh, regular headset that has the two jacks, one for mic, one for um, your your speakers, I would always opt for those if you want quality, if you want like the audio quality. But if you just want something that works, you don't want to have to set it up, you don't have to worry about all that nonsense. Get yourself a USB one because it'll work just the same, um, and it'll do what you want to do. But um, five point one surround and all that. I got to tell you, uh, it's all of that's marketing gimmicks. Don't fall into that. Yes, there are Logitech 5.1, you know, headsets that claim like the G series that claim you can hear from you know two different directions in there. They still only have one speaker. The way that they're built, um, as far as uh, the audio inside the ear cups, emulates a, a a surround sound environment, but it's it we will not have a discernible difference between that and a pair of cans, which is what I call these. They Audiophiles call them cans. Um, don't don't get sucked into the whole surround sound USB hits and headset thing because anybody worth their weight and and anybody that does anything with recording studios, any guitarists out there, um, every you can ask any of them. They'll all tell you that it's a bunch of baloney and to get yourself a nice 2.1 headset like a Sennheiser, and that will blow your mind. <laughs> all right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, just one final note to kind of add on the sound thing. Um, I uh, I actually use a totally different setup from I think everyone else in the guild. I was just about streaming. to ask you about that because okay. what we've been talking about so far is single computer, like you're playing and streaming using the same computer, and that requires a very strong uh, CPU and a and a good video card and like a, like we said a lot of RAM because you're doing the streaming and the recording and, and the playing on the same computer. But Oku, you've got a second computer that is dedicated to streaming and you play on another computer so tell us about that setup 
Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, first baseline, it's a lot more expensive. Um, you know, you're going to spend way more on a totally new PC, um, you know, with all the other stuff, the case and the power and all that other stuff than you will in just upgrading your own. The reason I did it, um, I played around with streaming on my primary gaming PC, and uh, in my experience, uh, you know, you had to play in a window. I didn't really have the game source thing, which I think solved this problem a bit, but you had to play in a window. Um, I noticed a little bit of impact on the FPS, and for me, like, I, I can really, like, tell the difference between 60 frames and 80 frames. Um, and it was a really big annoyance to me. So I just said, you know, forget it. I'm just doing the whole dedicated setup. And the benefit you get with that is, um, so the way it works is you have a separate PC that just streams and it has a capture card in it. And then on your gaming PC, you have, uh, you know, another output, like it would go to another monitor and you just say, clone my output. Uh, so you have your primary monitor and then it clones that to the capture, ca capture card. And so what you have there is pretty much, I would say, the minimal amount of impact to your gaming machine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the streaming PC does all the work on its own of the streaming. Your only impact you might have is on your bandwidth just because you're streaming. Um, but the gaming PC itself plays completely perfectly. And I play games like um, Quake and, uh, <coughs> and Battlefield. It's like any amount of, of delay would be very noticeable in frames. So mm -hmm. um, I definitely yeah. like that. Now, I know you mentioned you were having some problems with like delay from your audio and your video, like they weren't necessarily <coughs> matching up. Right. Uh, what did you do to combat that? Like, how did you fix that issue? So, yeah, so there's a lot of quirks. Um, you know, it sounds really simple. Like, right, I just described it. It sounds kind of simple. But um, the first quirk I dealt with was uh, the audio you hear. Um, so, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, when you're out, when this, the game PC itself can only output the audio to one, one source. So unless you have, like, a splitter or, like, a mixer, um, you're going to have to listen to your game PC through your stream PC. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you get is maybe a slight delay with X split. Um, now, now, since then, I bought a splitter and, and solved that. Um, but if you don't have that splitter, then you're listening to your gaming PC through your stream PC, and you have a slight delay with X split. It would work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, but it's, you know, specifically on the audio issue, um, I took Free's advice, and I was like, you know what? I'm buying a sound card. I've got to get into this whole new world of, of trebuchet <laughs> explosions and... Um, but I made the mistake of buying a, a cheaper sound card. Um, I bought the uh, Zonar, I think it was the DG. It was the just DX. Specifically, okay, I think mine was the, the DG. It was just specifically for yeah. And I found that with the cheap, heads, the cheap uh, audio card, I actually had some issues. And it might be specific to XSplit. Um, but when I was streaming for a few hours, I would get this like crackling, popping noise. And if anyone's ever seen my stream, um, they might have noticed that issue. And I had to always restart XSplit every few hours. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to troubleshoot that and figure out what the issue was. Yeah, because that sounds like a nightmare. It turned out to yeah. be the, the sound card itself? Well, I mean, I can't point the finger at the sound card, but basically I removed it and I haven't seen it since. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I think cool. I, I, I would put that on um, trying to get by on a cheap sound card. So, you know, when it comes to this kind of stuff, if, you were gonna, if you're going to go in, don't go in. Don't go try to go in cheap. Um, the capture cards I bought are the Avermedia Game Broadcaster HD. They're about 100. I think they're about 150 now. That one is recommended by DJ Wheat as well, yep. if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Yep. Um, my camera is also quite Say different. that name again. Avermedia what? Uh, it's the Avermedia Game Broadcaster HD. All right. Um, I'm, so pulling up and I'm putting the link in the show notes for anybody that's listening to this after the fact as well. Yep. And so then my camera setup is also quite different. I, I don't use a webcam. I use a, uh, what is the model number on this thing? It's a Panasonic HDC 300 something. It's like a $800 HD camcorder. <laughs> um, and that's actually plugged into a, a capture, another capture card. Um, now, I would not recommend doing this setup um, with the HD camcorder. And actually, DJ Wheat said the exact same thing um, in his streaming setup that he did at, uh, I think it was PAX. Um, you don't you know, have pets, do you? <laughs> you don't have a cat, do you? No, I don't. I have dogs. Yeah, yeah just that says enough for me. <laughs> are you suggesting that webcams are superior to having uh, expensive HD cameras? I, I'm suggesting that that cats are like homing missiles to expensive things on shelves. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> well, uh, since you since you probed there, I actually have my. I wish I had a mirror right now. Um, I have my camera actually mounted with a $200 magic arm. It's a whatever you call it, Manfrotto. This is a really <laughs> cool camera device. I, I did photography as a hobby for a while, so I have this really amazing arm that's like, it's actually a really cool piece of technology, but it, it can like move in every possible direction, and then you like flip this one switch, and everything becomes rigid. 
Um, oh, yeah, yeah one everything of those, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, you get those, there's like boom arms like that for the, uh, for microphones as well. Um, yeah. So lastly, we should point out that this streaming setup that Oku is talking about is, as you said, very expensive. So it should be only really pursued by people who either have more money than they need or people <laughs> who already know, like, I really like streaming. Like, let's get back to if you are a brand new to this and you're going to be setting up on a single computer, which is actually what I do. Like, I'm doing a ton of this stuff, but I can still do really good quality stuff just with a single computer. So let's talk software. Um, mm -hmm. Now, XSplit is by far the sort of far and away, like, thing that all streamers use, to my knowledge. Like, there may be a few exceptions out there, but all major streamers use XSplit. And it's even recommended by Background Bird, if you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> They, they love XSplit. So let's go over a couple of the, 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 the pros and cons here of the various software options. So this is what I came up with, and, and Freelancer, afterwards, please let me know if you have any other suggestions for people. But XSplit is actually not that expensive. Uh, it is a subscription-based piece of software. So you subscribe for a certain period of time, and for that period of time, you can use the full experience of the software. But after that, you would revert to the trial version of the software, which has limitations. And you can download the trial version and use it for as long as you want with the limitations that are in it. Uh, so that would be a great way to determine if XSplit is the kind of thing for you. Uh, and it, it ranges from 40 to 60 per year, depending on if you're going for a personal or a commercial license. Uh, and it can even go lower than that if you buy for more years at a time. Uh, it also is the thing that I use to produce this very show. And it can record locally in addition to streaming. So if you want to use this as sort of a dual purpose thing, not only to stream, but also record video to be post-produced, uh, you can use that for this purpose as well. I'm going to quickly bring it up on the screen here so you guys can see what it looks like. Now, it's going to be a little bit confusing to you because what you're going to see is uh, the infinite mirror effect, like going deep into here. But hopefully this is, is enough so that you get the idea. What you see here is the window where I can bring in other things. To a different scene uh, and you can see it changed it's because now I have other things in the screen I can have my my own image and I can move it around to wherever I want I can resize it so this is the tool that we use to broadcast the show and what this allows you to do in a typical streaming setup when you're streaming a game to something you take a picture of yourself and you put it up in a corner somewhere where it's not being used uh, or maybe like right here where there's dead space in the UI where nobody's doing anything because people like to look at the person who's talking as they comment or playing the game. They like to see the facial expression. They, and, and again, we're social animals. We like to see what's going on there. So that's one of the reasons we recommend a webcam is specifically for this particular setup. You have the game going on in the rest of the screen and a little picture up here. And if you wanted to do even cooler stuff, I mean, iDrive, as you can see, he's showing us video. He's using XSplit to broadcast through Skype to me as we talked about Streamception before. So as you can see, there's a lot of different things that it can do. We can obviously have stock pictures sort of pop up here and we can relocate those wherever we want those to be. So this is sort of an example of the kinds of things that XSplit can do. But the basic thing that you're going to do with XSplit, if you're not like, if you're just starting out, is you're going to have the game being recorded in the main screen, and you're going to have yourself in the top corner, and that's all you're going to do. And maybe you'll have a screen where you go to that says, you know, we'll be back soon. All right, and that way, if you go to get a drink or something, everybody's going to know. Or it'll say, I can change this to say, you know, be back at one o'clock, and that way, everybody watching my stream can know hey, stick around, this is going to actually, something's going to happen. So that's what makes XSplit such a powerful tool to use for this kind of broadcasting. Uh, Freelancer, anything to add to that? No, I mean, you kind of hit on the main points. What makes XSplit what it is and why it's actually, yes, it's worth the 40 to $60 or whatever it is now, it changes pretty often, um, is you can set scenes. What Bridger was just showing you guys is called scenes, and you can set them to hotkeys. So... While I'm playing a game, mm -hmm. uh, Guild Wars 2, I can do Control 1 and go to a scene that shows my webcam, you know, um, and then I can do Control 2 and flip to a transition video, which iDrops provided me because uh, he's <laughs> awesome like that. And, um, you know, and then I can press Control 1 again and go back to Guild Wars 1, you know, and, and, and you could do all that with XSplit. There are other programs out there, um, but none of them are as seamless as XSplit, um, plus as terms of the codecs being used, you know, the HD uh, codec that XSplit innately uses is far superior, in my uh, my own opinion, to some that you'll find on other free programs. For example, those of you that stream uh, with uh, Ustream, uh, if you've ever tried that, they provide a free download client, and it, it's mediocre, but the codec they use for that, the encoding codec, 
uh, is horrible. It's very taxing on your computer, and it doesn't matter whether you have a, a Sandy Bridge or not. You're not going to be able to stream a 1080p game with that kind of codec. It's more designed for like web pages and and webcams by themselves. I mean, we, I don't know how many people here have seen the the webcam like the kittens and stuff. I mean, it's insane what some people use with it. But uh, and that's fine for that. But if you want to do some high quality streaming with gaming as well. Um, you can put out just the same quality as Oku's little system there if you have a decent rig of your own uh, using XSplit. And um, it's uh, it's pretty pretty nice. It's easy to, to pick up. And they have guides and yep. stuff that show you all the fancy stuff. I would say, I mean, the, the cool thing about XSplit is that it gives you the, I would say, the power of a lot of the settings that you have available to you when you're streaming with Flash, but it sort of encapsulates them. I mean, there's really only... Um, I guess four or five. I guess four settings that you need to care about in XSplit, um, and you know, read in up about and learn how to In terms of quality of the stream, is that what you right, mean? Right, exactly. Like yeah, bandwidth I mean, have... and, and and bit rate and, and audio rate and right. Uh, the, yeah, you're right. It doesn't. It it really does give you a lot of tools because if you were to actually look at all of the different things that you could change in a codec. The list right. is massive. It would just be like your whole screen filled with settings. But what yep. they've done in XSplit is provided you with presets that they've gone ahead and tested and said, okay, this one provides the best, you know, performance on your computer for, you know, it gives you the, the, the low, you know, lower quality than these other presets, but it provides you with the best performance. So if you've got a low-end computer, you use this one. And then you steadily go faster and faster to where... XSplit starts using more and more of your CPU, but it's providing you with higher and higher quality compression through the codec. Right. And you don't have to know anything except that this is a scale, and if it turns out that as you go down this scale, you're losing frames in your game, you just go back up again, and then you're done. You're, you've set it up. It's done. So I, I agree with you completely about how useful that is. And as Freelancer was saying, this codec is sort of designed for performance and power users like us as gamers. So that's another thing that makes it very useful. Um, I draw. Uh, that, I mean, I use it as well. Obviously, we've been talking about it for a while now. But yeah, I mean, as as long as you can get to know what each one of the settings does with an XSplit, it will do everything and more to your heart's content of whatever you desire to do for streamings. All right, now freelancer, uh, I asked you about I this set up once. Podcasts and stuff, and oh yeah, uh, they asked me pretty consistently. Like, um, you know, Team Legacy, we have this podcast, Tales of Tyria, going, and everybody wants to make another podcast of their own, you know, and uh, and that's great. You know, we, Tales of Tyria is not going to be the only podcast out there. But when they ask me consistently, well, how do you guys do all that? How does Bridger set all that up? And I tell them XSplit. They're like, well, I don't want to spend the money on that, you know. And <laughs> well, well yeah, you know, I, I have to. I have to break it to you. There's there's three little let's just call them straight talk rules that I'm just gonna say straight out. This is how it is, or you can forget streaming. One, you need <laughs> to stream at 720p. No exception. If you're not streaming in 720p, you're not gonna have a large following base. And if you're not gonna have viewers, if you're not gonna have people subscribing and watching you, what's the point of streaming in the first place? Unless you want your girlfriend to tune in or something i don't know um so you need to be streaming a 720p you need to make sure that your settings are set to that and that you have a nice crisp stream uh secondly you got to have 25 frames per second you know no matter hard what hardware setup you have uh you need to be running at least 25 frames per second because when you're moving around doing all the fast clicking and especially with strategy games um more so than mmos people like to see that they pick up on that um they like seeing where your skill comes from and and all of the we call it apm starcraft players but they like to pick up on all that and they they learn from that and then um lastly is it's not free you're not going to create a streaming setup without spending some money and you need to know that up front you need to get a decent mic if you're doing a podcast you need to make sure those with you get got a decent mic but um you know bridgers i guess you're going to move on to the entertainment part right now right well actually uh techie asked a question and i was going to direct you to you oh um so what what the question next question was within XSplit, some people have looked at uh, a link on on uh, Team Liquid that talks about using DX Story and XSplit together to record a game. So why don't you walk us through how do you rec capture and get the game into XSplit? Because there's a couple of different options. Right. Well, XSplit has the the biggest fallback on XSplit, and this is this is echoed through the forums, is that in order to capture the game. Uh, 
basically the content going from your video card to the game, it basically attaches itself to that. I don't know if you're aware of how that works, Bridger, but uh, when you assign a screen, when you go to select screen capture, you're telling mm -hmm. it what what channel you want it to take from the video card. Now, the biggest drawback of this is if you run a full screen game, you cannot run XSplit and capture that full screen. The only way to do that is either run FMLE or set up something like what Oku has, where it'll actually take your direct stream coming from your VGA port or DVI port um, or your video out you know, with your card. So if you are playing a game that does not have a uh, windowed full screen option, you can't use XSplit. Now, thankfully, most games these days, except for, like, recently, I realized that um, that Empire Total War does not have a windowed full screen. There is um, actually a project, and I'll probably put a link to this in the show notes as well, called Borderless Window. It's a program right. that I use mm -hmm. to get Civilization V, which does not have a borderless windowed or windowed full screen mode, to, go, to force it into a windowed full screen mode. And it works mm -hmm. for many games, not all. But that is a mm -hmm. fallback, and I'll throw that into a link in the show notes. Yeah. Shift Window but, is also a good uh, program for that Shift exact Window, that's same another process. One. Yep. Yeah. So what I do is if if I am playing a game that requires full screen, um, and you know I, it, it stinks either way, but if I have to, I do. I will run um, Flash Media Encoder, which that's a whole another bag of tricks all on itself. Most that's very complicated setting that up. A lot of people have trouble with it, but you can use basically a screen capture program like I use uh, VHS uh, uh, crap they call it. <laughs> And uh, I use that to send uh, video data to Flash Media Encoder, which is in the show notes. And that's completely free, by the way. And it will capture, it basically does what Oku Setup does. It's a virtual uh, video capture card. It's exactly what it is. It's the easiest way to explain it. Um, but if you you got to have Windowed full screen in your games. Um, you got to, I recommend XSplit. And if you don't, get Flash Media Encoder and set that up. Don't. Don't mess with any other programs because otherwise it's not going to look right. What about XSplit's uh, game source where it pulls directly it from a full screen game? It doesn't work like they advertise it does yet. Um, it only works with specific games as well. They yeah, have it's, custom code. For oh, that's right. Really? Yeah, so they, they're adding games on a consistent basis, but they're never the games that you're playing. You know, Murphy's you won't Law. find one for Star well, recently they added StarCraft, I believe, but um, you know, you won't find one for Guild Wars or you won't find one for uh Kingdoms of Amalur, you know, when it came out. You won't all the big games that come out, they take like three weeks to come out with their codex. So when everybody wants to tune in to watch the latest game, like when Portal Two came out, okay, um, you know, it was really bad then as well because uh, you had to run Portal 2 in full screen. There was an issue with uh, Windows 7 to run it in windowed full screen. I don't know if you guys stream Portal 2, but I did. I had uh, 300 streamers going and stuff, and they kept asking, you know, how are you streaming this? Because we tried, and it kept crashing on us. Well, I'm actually using Flash Media Encoder, and I had to kind of explain to them how. So that's like my backup, but I use XSplit for everything else. So, so Flash Media Encoder is the there, – there's that big, huge thread on Team Liquid use, talking about using DX Story. Right. In place of Flash Media Encoder, but one of those two, I guess, uh, seems to be the option. But for mm -hmm. me, everything that I have been trying to do with XSplit, I haven't had to go to that extent. And that's specifically because, as iDrops are talking about, this is the one I was thinking of, actually. This is the one I use called Shift Window. And what it basically does is it... Uh, it, it takes the window, which normally has like the border on the side and it has the taskbar on the top that you can click and drag, and it basically stretches those out to fill your whole screen, even though those are still there and the game still thinks it's in a normal window, they're pushed off of the monitor so that you don't necessarily notice. So that is, has, has so far been an alternative that has worked for me in the few games that don't have a borderless full screen option, such as Civilization V. Uh, now it did take a little bit of finagling, I had to go and after you get it to stretch out, you have to go and tell it to re re uh, go into the the right resolution but then it did work so anything any of you have any other recommendations besides xsplit or flash media encoder that we have here should i put anything down in this list as a recommendation for our mm -hmm. listeners well team liquid of course that's kind of like my my homeland um that's all my buddies are there. That that's a huge streaming community. What made StarCraft what it was, and what made StarCraft of the esport it is. I mean, StarCraft was an esport long before League of Legends. So I don't even bring that up because I know, oh, well, League of Legends is a, is an esport now. StarCraft's an esport. Uh, that's a streaming community. You have Koreans that stream. You have uh, there's a massive fan base for people following. I mean, I don't know of any uh, eye drops. Who do you think's the big biggest League of Legends player? Biggest in terms of viewers or in terms of just right. like 
results. terms of actual like public viewers, like streaming, etc. Hotshot et cetera. GG is probably the guy. Hotshot shot GG. Yeah. So, uh, would you say he, that he is equivalent or equal or greater than to, let's say, Idra? Uh, in terms of what? <laughs> Rage? <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> uh, but what I'm getting at, guys, is, is if, if you're wanting to get in structured PvP and stuff, you know, get just get the best. You know, don't, don't mess around with all these subpar programs. Get X Split. Get Flash Media Encoder. Get one of the two. At least get Fraps. I mean, everybody should have Fraps, you know, because of the obvious reasons. I'm sure we'll go into that second. But, um, you know, and get get your videos out there. That's that's the excitement yeah. of it. We're we're heading into a, th a a time now. We're five years from now. I, on television, you'll be able to watch people streams. I, I really think that. Mm -hmm. I really do. And mm -hmm. um, this is where it all starts. You got to get your Don't, fan base. Yeah. Up. Definitely don't spend a thousand dollars on a PC and then say you're not willing to spend forty, sixty, or eighty dollars on an Xbox license. That's I mean, true, actually. That's yeah. a very good point. If if this means enough to you, you're gonna be uh, you're gonna want to stream. So let's move on to a a couple more ancillary topics to the whole streaming thing because it's not just the hardware and software that you're using. It's not just mastery of changing oh, scenes and XSplit. It really, if you want to be a good streamer, it takes it takes the right uh, sort of entertainment value to make your stream what it is. Now, I kind of put a couple of things in here, but first, you need to develop a shtick or a personality type, something that makes people want to watch you for a specific reason. And personally, for, for me, when I stream, I usually take on the role as sort of the educator or maybe the entertainer, depending upon uh, you know the game that I'm playing. If if I'm playing a game, and sometimes I'll make, I'll crack jokes about what's going on in the game, like this doesn't make any sense, and here's why, or I'll you know do a voice like, oh, why does this happen? You know, blah blah. So I'll try to take on the entertainment role, make make things entertaining and funny and good to, fun to watch. Or when I'm playing Civ Five and people are in the chat room going, oh, I haven't played Civ Five before. What are you doing and why? Or or oh, I've never thought of that strategy. Why are you doing that? Then I take on the role sort of the educator is someone who's okay so I've been playing this game and here's my strategy and we're going to enact it and see what happens oh look what happened there that's because of, he went with this thing and that way people can watch your stream and learn how to play the game better even if you're not necessarily a fantastic player they can learn from your mistakes as they're watching you as long as you have the right mindset to show oh that, that was a bad mistake analyze your own mistakes you can still provide a huge educational value to people because that basically is experience for them they don't have to experience that firsthand now they've experienced it through you so mm -hmm. and then of course the expert is the person that maybe doesn't say anything at all and you just watch their play because it's so good and it speaks for itself you know or because they're so concentrated yeah. so you got two sides of the fence here you got two kinds of viewers you got the people that tune into your stream because you were just a solid player they want to learn from you like they were you were most likely referred um, so they're coming to your stream expecting to see solid gameplay those kind of streams sort of they they do their own work because word of mouth passes quickly on somebody that is really good um, you know what can make those better but is not required is talking during the stream and such but some of your top streamers out there and i do mention a lot of starcraft pros when i'm talking to people is they don't talk during the stream they just play and they may have a webcam showing their facial expressions and stuff because their fans love seeing that but their the where their gameplay speaks for itself you know most people will grab a bag of chips and just watch them play and learn from them mm -hmm. um and i and i always encourage that um then you have the other type of of streamer, which is, uh, I'm gonna poke some fun at you, Bridger. That's like Bridger, okay? Where he uh, he stinks at his games. No. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no crying to my but, tails, a tear in my but, mouth. All right, let me just let me just say it say it out. If you are not awesome at your game and you're thinking that, oh, I'm never gonna get uh, never gonna get any you know followers or, or people watching my stream because I'm I'm just not good yet. Well, that doesn't mean that you don't turn on your stream and you just you practice without leaving your stream. No, turn on your stream. Talk, make it entertaining. Uh, entertaining. It's people want to relate to you. You have to fill a certain personality type. Certain people will fall in line with if you're just comedic. If you always have like jokes, to, you know, genuine, good, you know, good-hearted jokes to say about your your opponent, even if he's kicking your butt, you just you love throwing out little jabs and stuff. Certain people pick up on that. Um, if you are somebody that's more analytical and you're just you're learning and you just picked up a game, and you're not good at it, but you're you're given every little piece of advice along the way, then that's great too. People will pick up on that. You'll get a certain base from that. Not everybody wants to watch the elitist guy that 
knows everything about the game because they might not be able to pick it up at that pace. Mm -hmm. So you have to develop an image for yourself. Eyedrops, one of uh, Team Legacy's biggest streamers, uh, he has an image that people love watching. He has a big following base because of just the way he carries himself on the stream. Is he the best League of Legends player ever? No, you know, but it doesn't matter. People will turn and tune into his stream over all of the top players all the time because of the fact that he has a personality. So develop your personality, and that's that's really what my rant's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would kind of just tag on to that if I could. I think really, if you boil it down, the primary thing you need to get going is the, of your interaction. Um, I, you know, if you're not doing the expert thing, which I think is, is also a very viable thing, but, you know, viewer interaction is, you know, it's not only more fun for the viewer and you're going to get more people who are following you and, and you, do, you build that community in your stream, it's also more fun for you as the streamer. Um, you know, I've streamed and if you don't have a single person watching, you're just kind of like, why am I even doing this? I'm just playing and mm -hmm. you know, going through this extra work of setting up XSplit and you know, sending out a tweet or whatever you're doing to, to broadcast and you're not getting any viewers, it's not as fun. And so if you can interact with the viewer, then you know, that makes it more of an exciting time for you. And you're looking forward to the next time you're streaming. You know, you're, even when if you get it's done, just that thinking, one guy that comes in your channel yeah, and exactly, goes, oh, yeah. hey, I see you're playing that <laughs> game again. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Interacting with the viewers. And that, that comes again full circle to why we said dual monitors is really important. If you can't see the chat, that, then you can't interact with them because mm -hmm. you can't get the feedback and let them know hey guys I can see the chat so if you want to say something I can see it I can respond to you because otherwise they will not necessarily assume that you can see what they're what they're typing and they won't type anything uh, yeah. and and that and I just came up with a, a really good idea so let's say you want to get started in this but you don't have like any listeners you don't have a community like this like I got started but I had people that would watch because of Tales of Tyria right so that would make it easy to get started and get a few people building slowly whatever but let's say you're just a Joe Schmo and you want to get started doing this one of the best ways to do it I would recommend is is find a niche game that you play that you really enjoy that not a lot of other people play because if not a lot of people play it there's a really good chance that not a lot of other people stream it when yes. I was streaming Civilization 5 Gods and Kings on the release day I had 80 people watching those weren't just Team yes. Legacy people those weren't just people from my stream there were very few Civilization 5 streams and so we captured a huge chunk of that audience because they were just trying to find one and so that is a very very good tip for you so find a game that you like that n not many other people and maybe you'll get a to other games and slowly build an audience and that way every time maybe you'll at least have somebody to interact with even if it's not somebody fluent in the next game that you're playing maybe they're just, oh I, I watched this guy play Civ 5 I, I don't know this League of Legends thing let's watch and see what he talks about you know that's that's kind of a cool thing too as well yeah for sure and I think uh, a big thing with since Guild Wars 2 you know hasn't launched yet and it's on the horizon that you could make a name for yourself within that Good point. Uh, environment. You know, there's not a lot of, there is no popular Guild Wars 2 guy right now. You know, you could be the next guy or girl that is the person you watch to watch Guild Wars 2. And um, that's really exciting for someone that's just looking to get into streaming and things like that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great time to do that. Absolutely. And there's also some other resources I want to throw it out there. Um, both TeamLegacy.net and uh, GW2 guru um, have a streams database where you can add your stream so if you guys are watching this podcast and you're sort of inspired to create your own stream and you think you have the hardware and you're going to get x split um, you know it doesn't hurt to throw throw it up there if you're a starcraft player and stuff uh, obviously i love team liquid.net they have they also have a streams database you can add your stream there so just random passerbys when they see you online it'll show you're online and that's that's a nice way to get more people watching so you got a network is what i'm getting at um you know, and get, get your name out there post in communities and don't just spam say this is my stream go watch it talk about you know more in depth on what makes your stream different from others and that's that's the big question because you only have roughly 10 seconds to capture a potential follower you know and that's the way i see it. that's the way i tell my team legacy guys you have 10 seconds from somebody watching your stream popping on for the first time before they make the decision right there that they're going to continue watching you spend you know however many minutes doing so or that they will never look at your stream ever again and you have to capture that 10 seconds what makes your 10 seconds with that with that viewer different from the other streams he's bouncing to and that's what it's all about absolutely all right, let's see. Any final things? Um, now, so uh, going along with this making your stream worth watching is always, always when you first get your stream up, check your quality. 
first thing you should do is, you know, when it gets up, if there's anybody in the chat room, say, hey, how does this look? Let me know. How's the so how's the sound? How's it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And listen to the feedback because if you are oblivious to the fact that your street, your audio and video is desynced for some reason, or your audio, your video is hitching all the time because you don't have enough bandwidth for what you're trying to do. That is a huge problem. Uh, so always, always check your audio and video quality yep. at the very beginning of your stream and make sure that people say, oh yeah, that looks good. Um, going along with that, something that I learned when I was, when I went to DJ Wheat's thing, when I was in, don't always assume that you have the bandwidth that you had yesterday. Because mm -hmm. at different times of the day, at different days of the week, if you're on like a cable connection like I am, your bandwidth is going to be determined by what people around you are using. So what he recommended and what I do all the time now is before I stream, I use the built-in feature in XSplit to do a bandwidth test. Mm -hmm. Now that bandwidth test is way more useful to you as a streamer than speedtest.net or any of those other speed tests because it specifically tests the bandwidth of, of your data from here to the Twitch server or whichever server that you pick and that it, it tries to do it in a constant rate like you would normally be doing when you're streaming. Sometimes when you're trying to do this uh, on like speedtest.net, it's testing your speed in a different way that is not as reliable for streaming. So I actually have something like seven meg upload if I'm uploading a file through like an FTP, right? Because I get these bursts of speed, but you don't want bursts of speed when you're streaming. You need consistent, constant bandwidth so that mm -hmm. every frame is always uploaded. So I have like seven or eight meg upload if you kind of up, if you check it at speedtest.net, but I only have three meg and sometimes like two meg upload if you check it on speed uh, on, on X split speed test. So always, always check that before you get started. And also if you're trying to figure out if you have enough bandwidth, download the X split trial and test your bandwidth using that. And that will help you get an idea of where you're sitting. Yeah, for sure. And that's, it, it really goes around the X split. You're connecting to their servers. You're connecting to the different servers that are available uh, when you're streaming. You're not connecting to the same ping test server that you're you're doing your speed test on so always use xsplit to test that out just like you said and um i, I let's talk uh, very quickly bandwidth what kind of bit rate should people be streaming at for let's say a 720p uh game that's going to be very different based on the the person so the way you're looking at your bit rates is uh in xsplit you have two separate bit rates um for the longest time you had um Debrader. Yeah, they've got a delay yeah, server now. That's that's really nice. Um, you know, now, um, but you still have two two rates. So you have a debuffer rate, and you have just the regular uh, bit rate. And I'll just kind of explain simply what the difference is. Your bit rate is what your constant streaming rate is at. Um, most people, uh, you will match that to about 80% of what your max upload is to make to ensure a solid stream. So, 1,000 is like one meg, okay, uh, equivalent. It's not quite exact, but that's kind of the golden rule. So if you have a three meg upload, you would set yours to about 2,500 uh, or, or a little lower, maybe 2,000 um, as far as your, your bit rate. Now your V buffer rate, if you guys ever watch like a YouTube video or if you ever, if you have a slower connection and you're looking at like Pandora or GrooveShark or whatever music program you use, if, you, if you've ever noticed how it preloads a video to a certain point, you know, it's like when you click on the YouTube video and you'll see that loading bar. It won't start playing immediately. It'll actually load a certain amount of the video. That's a buffer. And what that means, what that allows for is if your connection slows down or gets faster during the course of somebody watching your stream, that buffer is always there for them to be able to like not have any interruptions. So having a good buffer, which is usually you want to double whatever your bit rate is, it doesn't hurt it to raise it a more or less than that, uh, is good because if somebody doesn't have a solid connection, let's say it's uh, somebody coming from Australia or, or wherever and they're, they have a pretty bad connection going to a U.S. server anyway, you want to give a good bit of a buffer so that they're not experiencing a constant dropping out of your stream. Uh, keep in mind, though, that there is a limit to it. If you set your V-buffer too high, let's say my, my bit rate is 2,000, all right, and my V-buffer is 12,000, it will take somebody, let's say, that has a three meg download connection roughly an entire minute or more to begin watching my stream, let alone if they can watch it in the first place. So you don't want to set it too high because then people can't immediately watch your stream. There are streamers out there like myself. Um, uh, there's a lot of big pro streamers that have really solid connections uh, that don't put a buffer at all because they can ensure that they can provide a constant bit rate at all times. 
Uh, so if you have a fiber connection or if you guys are on a business connection, don't worry about a buffer rate. It doesn't apply to you. But if you're on a cable connection, something that constantly expands and contracts as far as your uh, bandwidth, uh, definitely put a buffer equivalent to about twice what your regular bit rate is. All right. Excellent. Now, there are a couple of high-quality extras that – uh, that Oku and I are going to show you uh, what exactly we're talking about here. So, Oku, why don't we uh, show them what it looks like behind the scenes? There we go. My this, immersion! This is what people were asking about. <laughs> what exactly is, and I'll show Oku as well, what exactly is going on here? Uh, is basically, this is how we do the, the I'm sitting in Divinity's Reach, or I'm sitting in the Mist, or Oku's sitting in Stone Mist Castle. It, this is called a green screen, and essentially you tell XSplit anytime you see the color green in this shade, and he's got a, he's got a light down there to make sure that it all that that it all has the same color. Anytime you see the color green in this specific shade, it's actually called a chroma key is the is the technical term. Um, anytime you see that, and I didn't turn it off here correctly, but you get the idea. Um, it will replace that color with a particular image. And, and you have to play with it, and it's not an easy thing to explain, so we're not going to cover it here. But if you have the money to invest, like, you know, these kind of screens, I think, Oku, yours cost like $130, and it came with lights and stuff like that. Is that right? That's right, yeah. And, and mine is a, is a more specialized model that is also a piece of crap, and I'm not going to recommend it because it actually pops open and then <laughs> folds down, um, which would be great if it actually opened straight, but instead it opens like, and it's all warped. And when it warps <laughs> like that, it doesn't actually hang from its post, and it's, it's a nightmare. I have to, like, put a screw in the wall to try and hold it in place. It's, ugh, Okay. And anyway. for those of you that are that, that are doing a podcast, you you guys can get green screens and stuff and make it all flashy. I'm gonna tell you like on a little freelancer side note, if you're just streaming, oh, don't absolutely. listen to them. Don't absolutely. listen to them. It's a it's a waste of well, your time. Well, you know, and money. it looks better than a closet. Nobody cares if a streamer has clothes. a green screen. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna want to pick a good angle for it if you don't have a green screen. Like the one freelancers got, you just see a, you know, a poster and a wall. Whereas the one that I've got <laughs> aims right at like the closet with all the clothes and dirty clothes and things like that. So yeah, no thanks to that. So uh, I, I think it adds to it. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of um, Scoots. If anyone watches Sir Scoots, Scoots mm -hmm. After Dark, and he was the first one I saw who did the sort of, and I just thought it looked <laughs> a lot cleaner. So. I figured, you know, I needed to buy lights at the time, and like you said, there was this kit for just over $100 that had three really high-quality lights with the umbrellas and everything, and uh, I thought it was worth it. <laughs> so, yeah, you can find those if you search, like, green screen or, or a green vellum or chroma, chroma key screen or something like that on, on Amazon. You can find a bunch of different options, uh, and, and don't take the one that S I got. S Singe, uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing the name, but Singe to us, Taos. Uh, kind of echoes my exact thoughts. Uh, to me, a green screen sort of takes away from the personality of the stream. I mean, I just moved into this apartment yesterday, you know, so I'm still setting things up and getting my posters up, but I'm going to have, like, all of my little geek toys and stuff behind me Absolutely. on the left. You know, I'm going to have all of my posters and, of course, my Walking Dead poster and my Left for Dead and all that on this wall and, you know, and all my brand stuff that I had back when I had the sponsorship, you know, all on that wall. And my wife's going to walk in and roll her eyes every time, but that, you know, it's my area. And I, think, <laughs> I, I think it's more personality, you know. I think that, you know, being able to show people that and being able to see my, you know, I win button right here, GG button, right, uh, is, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I guess to me, yeah. I enjoy watching streams like Day 9 that, that have that, you know. His posters that are behind him on Day 9 stream, if you guys have not watched Day 9, I, I, don't, I don't even know you anymore, but... Um, <laughs> Day nine, it, it, he's it's so much personality. We were t I was talking about that earlier, but aside from that, you could just he has new posters every once in a while, and he sets up his shelf differently, and and his fans react to that. They love that. They love seeing that, and I think that's a big part of uh, streaming as well, just having that history, and um, you know, fans like something to talk about when they pop in. They don't like seeing the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's why I, I switch back and forth between the mists, and. A battle in Ghost of Ascalon. But um, <laughs> I agree with you completely. And when I actually stream, I don't go through the hassle of setting up this piece of crap. because <laughs> Talk about my American flag free. <laughs> America. Go ahead America. and try to tell him you shouldn't have an American flag behind him. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. So yeah, the, uh, let's let's uh, let's move on. That that's that's a great thing to have. And like like Free said, if you can't afford, just put some cool gaming stuff. We're all nerds. Put your nerd stuff up on a shelf behind you and show off. I've got a four hundred dollar Lord of the Rings. Uh, board game collector's edition that looks it's in a wooden box I wish I could put that up behind me I don't have the wall space uh, so it, instead it's out in my living room but it looks awesome I got this great custom shelf and it's got my books next anyway let's go on to uh, very briefly talking about recording software because uh, what we've been talking about so far is streaming software and if all you're doing is recording like let's say your bandwidth is too low to stream but you still want to make cool videos you can absolutely do that if, you're, if your computer is fast enough to do it so the one that I would recommend is the one that I use. So if you watch my videos, like the 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 Lions Arch tour or the Golem, uh, the March of the Golems video or the Dreaming Bay video, all of those were made with Fraps, and Fraps has been a popular choice amongst gamers for a very long time, and it has a lot of advantages. And some of the advantages, for example, is it's extremely high quality. It yeah. what it does, just to break it down for you guys, is it actually basically records 30 JPEGs every second. And, and, and basically compresses those a little bit and then stores those as a media file. And it has its own special codec, and that is extremely high quality because you're not taking all those pixels and resizing them and re-encoding everything into a new format. You're basically taking the pixels exactly as they are, and you're putting them, you know, frame, 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 as many frames per second as you want. Now, that does come at a cost, and the cost is that you have massive file sizes when you are done. Mm -hmm. You can't just go straight upload your Fraps file to YouTube because it will take you days if it's a long video. Uh, it's, it's up to and even in higher than a gigabyte per minute of footage. And so if you're going to use Fraps, you have to have a big chunk of space on your hard drive or an external hard drive with like USB 3.0, for example, uh, that can store all this video. And that's actually what I use. I have an external hard drive that's USB 3.0, and I can record 30 frames per second with Fraps with no loss in quality at all. And uh, as a result, the main advantage of this is not only the high quality, but because it's not doing any compression and it's not actually taking your your game, your taking your CPU cycles to compress the data into a smaller package, you have a very low impact on FPS when you use it. I mean, I was in Skyrim testing it out before, just trying to figure out what my FPS was, and I added in some some cool high definition mods, and I was at like 45, and when I turned Fraps on to record, it went down to like 40. Like, that is a very acceptable drop. Can drop you from 40, you know, to, to 30 or more. So it, it's a, a very big difference in how much CPU that Fraps uses versus these other things. Now, the only other thing that I want to say about Fraps, it, it, this is why, you know, these are all the reasons why I recommend it. It also has a very cool cache recording system so that you can record the last X seconds. And so it's constantly recording the last, you know, 30 seconds of footage. So if you're playing Battlefield 3 or something and you only want to capture those super awesome moments when you, like, jumped out of your jet as you were doing this giant flip and then landed in it after rocketing another jet. Like, if you did that awesome move, afterwards you'd be like, why wasn't I recording when I did that? This thing will be recording constantly in the background, but it will be overwriting itself constantly as well. So it only ever has the last 30 seconds. And then you hit the button again after something cool happens, and bam, you've got the last 30 seconds on video constantly recorded right to your hard drive. So that's a very cool feature. Yeah. It's also extremely simple, and it's very straightforward. Another negative, it has very little to no documentation and no dedicated forum support. Uh, there are a bunch of other guides and stuff spread across the internet, but it is so straightforward you might not even necessarily need it. Um, no. so that, that's my whole uh, recommendation for Fraps. Any of you guys have any other things to say about Fraps? Yeah, I mean, I, just once again about Fraps and that buffer recording that you were talking about. I use that uh, basically exclusively for the last beta weekend. And if you're doing a lot of world versus world, there tends to be a lot of moving around and maybe not so much that exciting stuff happening, like you know, killing a doliac or whatever, or things like that. But then all of a sudden, you'll come across another group out of nowhere, and this epic battle that you can never imagine, you know, it just pops out of nowhere, and you're like, oh, I wish I was recording or whatever. But in this case, you already are because you're buffering the last... 10 minutes or whatever you've set it to. I think it can go so up to 16 just, minutes total, like 999 nine, nine seconds, yeah, I think. Yes, yeah, so like a lot of time that you can buffer and you can always just capture that. And then at the same time, you're not getting those huge files from just saving your whole world versus world exploration. You're just saving the, the really awesome clips that you're going to want to use later down the road. 
Yeah, that's a great feature. And, and you know, I probably spent one to two hours work time just sifting through all the VODs I did for the first Beta Weekend event and to be able to have that feature if I'd known about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it, it basically does save on a lot of your editing. But again, yep. Fraps basically requires you to go and re-encode the video afterwards if you want to upload it somewhere. Because I'm not going to be able to upload, you know, a 20 gigabyte file in any meaning, meaningful amount of time. But if I take that and I compress it onto a codec within like Sony Vegas, then now I can upload the thing which turns out to be only 500 megs or something like that. And it almost has the same quality because instead of compressing it in real time and taking up my game CPU cycles, I'm doing it much later over a much extended period of time so it can take that same quality and you'll get the videos that I put up there on the channel. You'll get what those videos look like. They basically, if you full screen those, they look like you're in the game. It's really astounding, and I was very happy when I finally got that working for Company of Heroes, and it works great for, for Guild Wars 2 as well. So uh, that's, that's Fraps. Uh, XSplit can also be used to capture, but again, we have the same problem of, you know, it does have that disadvantage of, of the fact that it's using up your CPU cycles. Now, if you've got a beefy computer, you might not care about that disadvantage, and maybe you just want to use something you're familiar with, or you want to use the cool tools that XSplit has to record with your face in the corner or what have you, then XSplit's a good choice, too. Uh, has anybody used XSplit for any local recording to create videos later on? Yeah, I've definitely done that a lot, um, coming from a caster background. Uh, I like to have kind of my material to work with at a later date, like the stuff that I've streamed to other viewers and to local record to like an external hard drive like you mentioned I just recently picked up um, this Passport external hard drive one terabyte and it's a USB 3.0 so you, you don't have any uh, problems with transferring that data but I send my local records to that so that I can go back at a later time um, you know edit out some plays or maybe a great call that I made or something that you know can go into a highlight reel and uh, use that high quality uh, footage from the stream so it's like you know, a recap of what's happened for everybody if they missed it. All right. Uh, any other comments on XSplit? I don't know. Freelancer, you, you usually only stream, right? You don't do any post-production usually? Uh, not really, no. I kind of leave eyedrops to do all the post-production <laughs> stuff. It, it's for me, I'm kind of in a weird scenario where, like, my footage includes guild leader footage and stuff. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, while people, they'll, they'll have the privilege, you know, to sort of see how I run the Guild and Worldly World, you know, as it's happening live, I make sure to delete all of that afterwards because I don't want people developing, you know, their strategies, basically stealing our ideas. It's kind of tricky, but, you know, a lot of my stuff ends up getting deleted. I don't have the, the liberty of uh, putting out tons of videos like I want to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Uh of a good compromise if you just if, if you have a good computer and you don't want to care about uh, you know giant file sizes and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Another option if you don't already have XSplit for example and you're just looking for a recording option, DXTory. I've heard a lot of very good things about it. It has medium quality, but it can also do the extremely high quality stuff that that Fraps can do, and arguably it can do it better because it has a special technology in it that allows it to basically stream to three hard drives simultaneously, so it can actually capture data faster than a hard drive can record it normally like you would you would you're going to reach a limit in fraps if you go above a certain resolution and a certain frame rate where you can't even stream it to the hard drive fast enough the hard drive literally can't write it unless you've got like an SSD or something uh, but DX story can actually sort of uh, stripe that over multiple hard drives and then you can put those back together afterwards as a single, single file so that can that sort of has a much wider range and it's sort of a, a, a combination of the two depending upon how you use it and I've heard good things about it. it it does seem to have a lot of features and a lot of customizability but on the other hand that can make it very daunting to new people it is it feels like it's got a lot of bloat to it almost um, mm -hmm. not necessarily a bad thing I'm not saying it it, uh, it has low uh, performance value but just that if you're new to this whole thing a lot of those buttons and knobs are gonna be like what the hell does that do I don't know uh, it also is not made by an English speaking developer I don't think um, I think it's Polish if I'm not mistaken it could be something maybe no maybe it's Asian <laughs> something anyway it's non English uh, non native speaking English so it's har a little bit harder to find documentation and support but yeah it's it's also fairly widely used uh, so it is also uh, comes fairly well recommended I haven't personally used it except to test it a little bit and I found that the impact on FPS was still more than fraps so I wanted to stick with fraps and uh, that's that's about it for DX yeah 
to sum it all up, just use fraps. I, It'll yeah. save you a lot of problems. I wanted to give people options, though, because I, yeah. I didn't know what you guys were going to recommend. Because I know what I've yeah. been using, but I didn't know what anybody else has been using. But that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so, last thing we want to talk about here, editing software. Uh, what do you use to edit with iDrops? Uh, so, basically, Sony Vegas Pro is what I do for rendering and... Now, that's $1,000. Uh, did did, so, that, that's hey. a really expensive uh, software. Uh, Hmm. Well, yeah, it was a gift. Someone gave it to me or something. Oh, but there you anyway. go. So, <laughs> so the pro version is very expensive, but you can get most of the features of the pro version with their, it's like a, either $50 or $100, depending <laughs> upon if you want the, the packaged in stuff. And it's called Sony Vegas Movie Studio HD. And it's basically the same stuff without yeah. the super features, which are basically for cinematographers, which you don't need mostly. But mm -hmm. it, it applies, and that's what I use. So you, you and I are on the same, same, uh, same level here. So go ahead and, and with, your, with your Sony Vegas pitch. Well, I mean, that's what I use to, to put things together. But, I mean, if you look on the screen here, I just put one of these videos. Now, um, for creating content for my viewers on my stream, I use After Effects, Adobe After Effects. Mm -hmm. um, I have CS5 right now. There is CS6 that's available. And this is where you can really get into it and make your own animations, make your own screens and calls for, uh, you know, for tournaments that you're doing, things like that. Now, there, this, of course, requires rendering after you've made the video. But uh, there are other software programs out there like uh, Wirecast and Wirecast Pro that allow you to change it on the fly. I don't have that, unfortunately. Those are uh, another one of those programs that you were mentioning that's, uh, that costs quite a bit of money. It's about $1,000 for the Pro version. Um, but this kind of stuff is really what, you, and to get, kind of get back onto what your streams, this is what people want to see. It's what, it separates you from everybody else. And um, if you can really latch onto a program that you kind of like and that you understand better than others, for example, Sony Vegas, After Effects, uh, what is there, Adobe Premiere, right? Like that's mm -hmm. another one you can use. Uh, if you can find one that you like using the best, that's really what's going to create the quality that you're looking for, as opposed to just like perhaps recording something and then posting it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's... That's just not what people want to watch. Yeah, and you could just fraps record something, throw it into like Windows Movie Maker, re-encode it so it's smaller, and then upload it to YouTube. But that is not nearly as good. You want to be able to like cut out like the non-important parts and, and paste them together or add transitions or add music or anything that's going to spice it up and make it look a little better. And it really doesn't take that long. It's also not rid ridiculously difficult either. Uh, so for editing software for, for, for people listening that are thinking about doing this kind of thing, I'd recommend Sony Vegas Movie Studio HD. That's what I use. It's only $50 if you get sort of the basic version. And trust me, you're not going to need more than the basic version. This, the, I got like the $120 version version and that just throws in uh, SoundForge because I thought maybe I'd use that. Sony Vegas does all of the audio stuff that I, I it, it was a complete waste of money for me. I just didn't realize it at the time. Uh, so so you can get the $50 one and it's, and it's fantastic. Uh, Adobe Premiere Elements is Adobe's sort of consumer grade version of their $1,000 software like you know but Elements is $100. So, and I haven't used Premiere, but I know a lot of people like Premiere, but for the $50 difference, you know, Sony Vegas Movie Studio HD might be the way to go. Um, I believe that there's trial versions for the, both of those programs. You can, you can easily check those out. For free options, the two that I found when I was looking around, uh, Virtual Dub and Avid Mux, I think those are like really, they're, they're open source ones that have all the worst features of open source programs. They're like very... Uh, in, they don't have any any easy to use UI. They have features, yeah. but you don't really know how to use them, and it's 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 harder than it should be. And I, I just can't recommend those free options. But if you just need to cut and paste some stuff and and put it together, they might they might do it for you for a while. Maybe even Windows Movie Maker. Uh, I mean, which even comes with the everything. even the YouTube uh, browser editor can do that. Though. That's true. I mean, yeah, if you could just upload you know, the stuff even to YouTube. Twitch TV's editor, if you're streaming, can cut and paste and take videos and combine them and yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. I think the big thing about using these types of programs is you're adding, you know, something. You're not just putting the, the, the content you have mm -hmm. together. And, um, you know, the, the two programs that we recommended there, what, Vegas Pro, or Sony Vegas let's, and uh, Adobe Premiere. Bridget, are... let's, blow up, let's blow up iDrops uh, image there and show that, that video you just played a little earlier, iDrops. Which one? Uh, the League of Legends intro, just to oh, show okay. people, like, you know, that's completely custom. It shows you guys what After Effects and uh, these actually do. Now, iDrops, you, you throw that up? Yeah, I'm throwing yeah. that up now. You made this. How long did it take? Uh, so I worked with another Team Legacy member. Many of you know him as Umph. He made the last portion of this video, the the final like uh, little uh, cutscene you'll see here at the very end. But basically, this is with After Effects that we were talking about, and this took us 
literally about a full week of work, um, just putting it together, conceptualizing what we wanted to happen, um, how to make the animations work, because this is front, done in After Effects. Now, with those other programs, they have animations already preset for you, and all you have to do is input whatever information you want there. Like right now, you're seeing the, the part that Umph made with the two fly-ins from the side. But um, like Premiere and uh, Sony Vegas have those animations already there for you. As opposed to After Effects, you're like making it from, you're building it from the ground up. You're actually designing the animation and, and setting each little different, you know, aspect of what's happening on the screen and things like that. So After Effects is very much a, uh, a more creative um, tool creative tool and a very hard, much more difficult to use. Like you need to know what's going on. Um, but uh, I would suggest if you're trying to make custom stuff, you know, get into After Effects. You'll have a lot of fun. There's tutorials on, uh, what is it, Video Copilot. They do a lot of stuff on how to make uh, different animations, things like that, and everybody kind of runs through those just to get a feel for the program. But then once you start understanding what the tools do, you know, the sky is the limit with a program like mm -hmm. After Effects, where you have like uh, Sony Vegas or Adobe Premiere, you're kind of latched into like their preset transitions, or like this is a fly-in animation, and you put words in it, and it comes in. You know, I mean, like it, you, it's. It's uh, much simpler and much easier for a beginner to really oh, get into. And I, and I can do some cool things with, with text and stuff in, in Sony Vegas. It, like I said, <laughs> this even the, the basic one with $50 comes with tons of different transitions and, 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 and you know word effects and things like that that you can play around with. The, the, I have a real problem recommending uh, After Effects unless you really, really want to get into it, though, because it is $1,000. And I looked, like, I can't believe there's not, like, a consumer-grade version of it for like a hundred bucks because I'd absolutely jump on that but I cannot right. afford to pay a thousand dollars a lot of times Rich you're just throwing it out there to all the viewers you can get After Effects a lot cheaper if you're in college oh yeah um, educational discounts that was, that's a good tip yeah that was how I got mine very very cheap um, you know a lot of a lot of college students can get a lot of things free or free or near like uh, less than half cost like Windows etc mm -hmm. and um, you just have to you have to know where to look um, check, they you do know, the hide resources. it on their website. Like if you go to the they Adobe do. website, yeah, it's, there's it's a not immediately available, but I do know that student editions uh, for learning editions, so to speak, so you can do it in the classroom, even though you're technically going to bring it home and do it there anyway, uh, are available for a lot of the Adobe products uh, like After Effects and uh, Sony Vegas, uh, especially. I know there's for certain there's a, a student or they call you know they'll call it a student edition, but there's a cheaper version of that, mm -hmm. which is the same exact thing, but you have to. Uh, you, a lot of those, you just have to prove that you're you're in. Yeah, usually or that you have to have like a .edu email address or something like that to to show right. something to and that that's effect. It. Yep. Yeah, and that's it, and then you're set. So uh, there are ways to get cheaper. Plus eBay, you know, a lot of people sit around for CD keys, legit CD keys. Um, you just have to search for the right reputation, reputable sellers uh, of After Effects, and you know you could always download After Effects. There's mm -hmm. free. You get free trial, but then you can purchase CD keys for four or five hundred dollars, which is a lot more reasonable. You know, if you're looking to buy After Effects, than if you were just to buy one straight out the box uh, from wherever. So, yeah, I would just uh, I would urge caution just at this moment, though. You know, if you're if you're looking to commercialize your stream or your videos or things like that, you definitely want to pay attention to the licensing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think some student editions say you know not for commercial use. You know, you might be um, right. Yeah, so I mean, just pay attention to that. I'm not saying. Uh, but if you're just getting started other, and you're not commercializing it, yeah. that that's definitely a good tip. And then if you're going to start sure. making money on it later, then you have to consider it an investment to get an actual license for these kinds of things. Yep. Um, yep. But I'm pretty sure the Sony Vegas Movie Studio HD, when you buy that for 50 bucks, just straight out, there's no licensing restrictions on that. You just you you can do whatever oh, you wow. want with what you make on it because that's the consumer edition and it has specific limitations. But all the limitations don't apply to me because I'm not making movies with cinematography and multi multiple camera angles and, and having to sepia tone things like I don't care about cinema t style effects so I get the best out of it without having to pay too much money so yeah, let's sure. let's get to close this out here um, we've got a, a lot of necessarily questions on okay so I'm editing this stuff how do I actually save it like what's the thing I want to save it in the the answer is always always h.264 is the Kodak that everybody uses now it gives you the best bang for the buck if you're saving a file uh, to try to get the highest quality for the lowest 
you know, megabytes, essentially. And the, the sometimes, like in Sony Vegas, it's known as Sony AVC is sort of their high-quality version of it. But it says, you know, if you dig into it, it's, it says it uses uh, H.264. Um, flash video is often used for streaming content. And, uh, like, when, when XSplit saves these files, it saves it in flash format. And that's fine, too. Uh, it's not quite as good as H.264, but it's also mm-hmm. quite, but it's still quite good, the one that XSplit uses. I think you so. can save an MP4 as well on XSplit. Yeah. If you have the license, uh, MP4 is just, I think, the container. So I right. think actually it's H.264 no matter which way you slice okay. it. So it's but the same codec. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's the same codec, if, if I'm not mistaken. And that's mm-hmm. why it, it's one of the that's it's right. really good. Um, so it's really just the container file. Unfortunately, and actually I should point this out because this is a big, big problem for me. I can't take files recorded in XSplit and import them directly into Sony Vegas. Sony Vegas just burps. It can't figure it out. It's like, I, this isn't a file. What are you talking about? <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's an FLV or, or an MPEG-4. It, it mm-hmm. doesn't recognize it. And there's other people on the XSplit forums that have the same problem, and I don't know exactly what the issue is, and I keep hoping they're going to figure it out because there are situations where I want to just take a Tales of Terry episode and edit it, but I can't. I instead have to, like upload it to YouTube and then re-download it after they've converted it because they usually have some really good conversion rates but or I have just like let my computer convert it with one of these other weird conversion programs because usually I use Sony Vegas to convert everything because it's a really great program that I purchased for that purpose anyway uh, that's pretty much it I guess Uh, we're on a long show here so I want to wrap it up Uh, the last thing I think uh, Freelancer you've got a, a little plug to make for the new Team Legacy YouTube channel right yeah we wanted to uh kind of create an official Team Legacy channel for Structure PvP, and uh, you know, as you know, Bridger, all of the great World v. World videos, like the Dreaming Bay video, we're going to get many, many, many more of those. Because mm-hmm. who'd have thought that got so popular? You know, um, the economy videos, like. I, I know Bridger. We talked about talking about more. We get tons of feedback on people that enjoyed my little rant on the economy mm-hmm. uh, about how I manipulate the markets and stuff. And people, I thought I was just talking to a, a wall, but apparently a lot of people enjoyed that. So, um, you know, be, me and you are going to be throwing up some videos on there uh, concerning more on the economy and actually breaking it down for those that really want to learn it, like the ins and outs. Um, if you don't want to be just that guy that right clicks and just sells it to that hospital and you want to make a ton of money, you know, we'll be putting out videos there. Um, besides that, uh, all of our structured PVP videos are going to be going up on there. Uh, big thing you're going to notice the Team Legacy is we put up videos that both where we lose, we put up videos where we got uh, stopped, we, we put up videos that we won. Um, we don't yeah. feel that you should edit or especially, you know, try to make yourself look Cherry more pick. than you are. Exactly, yeah. So. The biggest thing is learning from your mistakes. Uh, we actually go through and we talk about different things that we we did wrong or right. Um, we put up videos we lost and talk about that. Um, it's it's there for to be a resource, and I hope that everybody listening, you guys subscribe to it. Because we're going to have a lot of really good guides up there. Aside from the Tales of Teria videos, which will still be on Tales of Teria, um, mm-hmm. so everybody definitely get that to 5,000 subscribers. We're so um, close. But aside from that, all of our video guides that keep shooting up to the top of Reddit, it uh, doesn't matter what guide it is or March of Golems. Uh, if you haven't seen that one yet, guys, you need to go watch that. Oh, um, yeah. uh, all, of, all of our Team Legacy videos that go viral um, on Reddit, on the GWT Reddit, we're going to be putting on the Team Legacy uh, PvP YouTube from now on. So subscribe mm-hmm. to it. Be the first to know about it. That way when people are like, hey, have you seen this video where they put up 100 trebuchets? Wink, wink. <laughs> you know, uh, you could be like, oh, I already saw that. You know, yeah, I saw that already. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be good times. Yeah, uh, definitely. I want to stress that again. Try to help us out, guys. We just started up that channel. I, I think we had an old one, but we're transferring. We're trying to make it more sleek and uh, more enjoyable for all our viewers. We're you know we've got those daily videos and everything that we're trying to put out for everyone to to really see what Team Legacy is all about. So you know, hop over there, hit the subscribe button, and then down there in the in the right hand corner, you'll see the. The Sound Strategy Network, I think, is what it's called now. Or I think you were talking about changing that, possibly. Yeah, but that's we'll see if we that's change. That's the Tales I, I, of Tyria channel. Yep, I'll put a link in uh, my featured channels as well mm-hmm. right now. So wait, what is the actual link? Let's tell people right now. There's a link in the show notes, but it's Team Legacy PvP. Correct. Team that's Legacy right. PvP mm-hmm. is the ending of the YouTube uh, URL there. And all of the we're trying to link everybody's uh, everybody that's in Team Legacy, their accounts uh, together. So you'll see those in the featured um, different channels in the little bottom right section of the first channel page that you go to so you can hop back and forth in between everybody's pages as well as the Tales of Tyria page and things like that. But and, if you got and the, the time, best part, subscribe. 
Yeah, and the best part about it, uh, the Team Legacy PvP, it's named Team Legacy PvP because that's who's creating it. But nowhere in there will you find us trying to recruit you or any silly nonsense like that, like what's on a hundred other Guild Wars 2 channels uh, provided by other guilds. We we genuinely want to just teach people, teach, 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 you know, because I would much rather go out in PvP and have people using those same tactics they learn from our videos and make it that much more rewarding and have those epic battles in World v. World than to sort of keep all those secrets to ourselves and be all elitist and stuff. So a lot of guides and stuff are going to be posted on there soon. And then you guys also know that the Team Legacy forums has a ton of guides as well. Anything we learn, we, we try not to keep to ourselves. We, we throw it out there pretty consistently because that's how you create a competitive environment. Um, I think that more guilds and stuff should do that. Um, so we're kind of leading the charge with that. Yeah, I can, I can tell you right now, the things that I have in, in, in the plan right now is a crafting video that is really going to break down and crystal clear explain crafting because it's a very complex thing and the game does not really explain it to you unless maybe you read walls of text when you go up to the crafter so that's that's the first thing on my list the then there's two other things that i have currently in sort of the development stages one is going to be a world versus world guide that really goes and explains all the mechanics that are happening behind the scenes from a top-down perspective like how fast does supply generate how much of it gets from here to there on and and how fast does it take there so what i'm going to be doing on the next beta weekend is basically measuring all that out so i can have all the correct data and getting footage so we can really put that together. Uh, and, and then aside from that, like Freelancer said, we're going to have one on the market where we really mm -hmm. walk you through. I, mean, I did one on the economy, but it was sort of a general thing way before we actually learned everything about the game. So that's what, right. what, what I have planned. And definitely the World versus World one is, is, is going to go on the Team Legacy one, uh, I think, exclusively, because that's especially where that, where that basically lives. Um, yeah. And, and we'll, you'll probably see the other ones on both channels, but uh, it, it's, it's going to be a good time. So what do we get out of this entire stream? That we want everybody to stream, 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 and record, record, record. <laughs> That's why we're doing this stream. That's right. <laughs> exactly. We're here yeah. to pass on the knowledge. And I know a lot of people are going to be upset with this episode. Like, Arr. why didn't yeah, they talk they about talk, Guild Wars 2? Not about Guild Wars 2. I, I see it now already, Roger. <laughs> yeah. No. On the and horizon for me, you I just wanted what? to mention this real quick. I uh, didn't mean to interrupt or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I also, since this kind of goes hand in hand with our show about you know uh, making content for people, I also have a guide in the works right now. It's pretty much done. All I have to do is finish the, um, the, the editing on it and then finish the formatting for our forums. But it's going to be on casting because there's a lot of people out there. You'll see on the, ah. the Guild Wars subreddit, um, you know, like, hey, guys, I'm a caster for Guild Wars 2, blah, blah, blah. And you'll go into the video and they just clearly have no idea of what it is to really cast a game to someone. So at this and point, I... Uh... <laughs> I, I, so I went, I went to, to, and, the, um, to the keep because I thought there wasn't going to be anybody there. <laughs> yeah. So I've got that in the works, and that'll be available on the YouTube channel that we were talking about a little earlier, as well as on our forums on kind of, you know, the equation of what makes a good cast, uh, what are the different elements, how do you handle certain situations, things like that. Uh, so look forward to that as well. That's awesome. All right. So I think that's it. Immense. All right. So I think that's it for now. I know like, there was a lot of people that probably turned it off when we started talking about the hardware stuff, and that's fine. I know this is not going to be for everyone. This was a very specialized show because it filled a niche. We did have a bunch of people asking, or niche, however you want to say it. We did a lot of people asking, hey, how do you guys stream? How do you make the show, etc." We wanted to, to make sure that got out there. We wanted to answer that question for the people that were interested, and we didn't have a lot to talk about this week, so it seemed like a perfect time to do it. Hopefully, beta weekend number three, I mean, it could very well be next weekend. Not very high chance, but it could be. Well, you I got mean, the stress test coming the up. Stress the stress test is on Wednesday. I'm not going to be able no, to play so. it. I'm actually going to be at work. I have Tuesday off, but not Wednesday. Those jerks yeah. are new. I wanted uh, to throw a last little tidbit that um, I will be trying to do a segment from here on out because I'm getting tons of people coming to me about this. Um, you know, we get a lot of people asking, is Tales of Tyria a guild or, you know, all of that? Yes, we are. Uh, you know, Team Legacy is a guild, but more importantly team legacy is a resource and that's what tales of Tyria is as well it's for you guys um but uh, talking into that i i want i really want to do uh, maybe possibly at the end of the show bridger um you know a guild spotlight perhaps of of big guilds out there because team legacy oh, yeah. and all the all the great things we do we're not the only guild out there there's a lot of guilds watching even now um kai's guild you know we all love her she she hasn't been around in a while but i always poke fun at her and uh, and other, just any guild, uh, alliances are forming now, and they mm -hmm. want to sort of get their name out on the podcast and stuff. I think that's great. I think getting that community uh, 
sort of you know collaboration is great. So even though this is a team legacy sort of guild podcast, uh, we I want your feedback on on your guild. If you want a shout out on your guild, or maybe you are looking for more members, you think you have this great idea for a solid guild, and and you want to get a bunch of friends together, shoot an email to feedback uh, tales of Tyria. And uh, we'll see if we can just do a little spotlight on it. I think it'll be a nice thing to do for I, everybody. I think that would be great, too, because I got a couple of emails mm -hmm. recently where people asked, you know, I, I'm looking for a guild. Uh, Team Legacy might not necessarily be the fit for me. I'm looking for, like, a PvE guild, or you guys are full, in, in you know, Division right. 2 is full, and I can't make Division 1, so w is there a place I can go to find guilds? And I think this is a really good idea to sort of spotlight other guilds, that, like, here's a guild that's different, and here's what they're doing, and here's what their requirements are, so maybe you'll fit in here. I think that's a fantastic idea, and we get a whole bunch of different guilds, maybe one, one a week or something like that, if we can ever, if we can pull that off. Yep. So, feedback at talesofteria.com if you want to, uh, if you want to get involved in that. And, and uh, we'll one, last thing, one last thing. One last thing. Also, very last thing. We mentioned Frag World's town hall meetings. I'm glad oh, somebody yeah. mentioned that because I almost forgot. Um, I am. Uh, I am a, one of the moderators in those meetings. But what these town hall meetings are, if you're a guild leader or you're of a guild, let, if, even if you're not the guild officers or whatever, let your guild leaders know. These town hall meetings. Uh, link. Uh, we'll put it in the notes there, and it's also in chat. Uh, are incredible of getting your name out there and more importantly having a voice. ArenaNet listens in on these meetings. Uh, many of the devs will hear exactly what you're saying. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, you won't be interrupted. You'll be able to say what you think about the game. You'll be able to promote your community and what you're doing, your guild. Uh, every time, you know, I, I plead with everybody, get get out there, tell more guilds. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger and it's it only gets better the more voices you get in on these meetings. So that is uh, fragworld.org is hosting the meeting. Um, and uh, it's going to be kicking off, I uh, believe, Wednesday coming up. So you have two uh, days to let all Thursday? of your... Wednesday, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at Thursday, June 28th at 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, which is actually about 3 o'clock Eastern. Okay, I'm looking at the Guild Wars 2 Guru article on the front page. It says Wednesday there. So just oh, check it's out different, the, check out looking, the okay. link and uh, either one of those and figure out what day it is. Oh, um, I'm looking at the EU version. That'll be explaining everything. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. So, but more, it's just, it's all about getting your name out there. This is crunch time, everybody. You know, Team Legacy, we got our stuff, uh, you know, uh, we got our ducks in a row, but a lot of guilds right now are scrambling to, to get their things going. You you got to get out there and do all the PR stuff. You got to do the legwork and this these meetings, uh, podcasts, doing your own podcast, learning from this stream uh, on how to do your own streams itself. You're getting your member streaming. That's all great ways of getting your your foot off the ground and get going. All right, I'm adding a link to the show notes right now. So if you want more information about the town hall number three. Uh, you're going to find it right there in the show notes at talesofteria.com. And I was, yes, it looks like there is uh, North America, Wednesday, June 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And that's going to be on a TeamSpeak server. They'll also have a live stream if you just want to watch. So, yeah, I think that uh, about wraps it up. We've already gone over the two-hour limit, so I'm going to have to pull some major shenanigans to get this show pulled together <laughs> because I can't put it into Sony Vegas. Hello? Anybody expert listening? Filing more bug reports, maybe. I don't know. I'll help you afterwards. All right, we'll make it work. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching Tales of Tyria. Remember, we're almost to 5,000. Get us there. Come on, guys. Anybody that feels like we deserve it, send us a subscribe. Sound Strategy Network is how you can find us on YouTube. Even if you're an audio listener. If you're an audio listener, send us a review on iTunes. And not just because I'm asking you to. Give me a real one. I like the critique. Right now, we've got a five-star. Every single person who's gone there put five stars. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you to go put one star, <laughs> but I'm just wondering, where's all my criticism? Come on now. Go there and put a review up. doesn't matter if it's good or bad. I want to hear from you. And I honestly, not just, don't troll me. <laughs> I just asked for it, didn't I? I'm just an idiot here. All right. We're going to close it before I can make any more mistakes to my mouth. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. See y'all.
Let's be a clear. Nice. Zoomed in on me right when I was watching for the stream reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just thought it would be cool to zoom in on everybody and show your names again, and then I realized that my when I switched to me, it didn't have my name loaded up because I forgot the oh, man. beginning. So I missed uh, I missed out on my own self emotion. They're like, who's this host guy? Like, I know that's Oku. I know that's Freelancer and Eyedrops, but then this other guy pops up. <laughs> we're all done on the stream. We're, we're still on the stream, but it's, it's uh, over that so penguin. Um, yeah, that penguin was. You put that it's up so every time awesome. you talked. <laughs> It was hilarious. Penguin. Penguin. So yeah, man. Awkward. If I get on Penguin. some more shows, I'll go out and buy a webcam. Or I'll just uh, <laughs> go get my old one. It's being guarded by my crazy ex-girlfriend right now in Seattle, so I'd have to go get it from her. Faye Warner wants to know if you shaved, Freelancer. <laughs> uh, that laugh is scary. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> what did he say? He said he's not answering that question because you laughed so scarily. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound evil, does it not? It does, yep. Yeah. It's right. a cackle. Uh, I, uh, every once in a while, I went, uh, well, Bridger, you understand this. I think uh, this is kind of speaking to 10% of those listening. But uh, when you are married, uh, sometimes you have to make sacrifices. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you you, and, you uh, like the goatee, but this is, a, this is one of them sacrifices. Yeah, this is one of those sacrifices, uh, unfortunately. Ah. Uh. All right, that was a good show. I gotta mm -hmm. figure out a way to get this stupid thing into Vegas. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 what's even worse is I have a great program that I've used for everything else. Boilsoft Video Splitter and Boilsoft Video Joiner allow yeah. me to split and join video. Right? It's exactly what it does, and it recognizes the format that uh, XSplit puts out. So it's like, oh, this is fantastic. So, because that's all I need to do to this show is cut off the beginning and cut off the end, so that when I upload it to YouTube, it's just a complete show. It doesn't have the, the this discussion. It doesn't have the the intro where we're setting everything up. So mm -hmm. I split it up. Boom, done. Upload to YouTube, fails every single time. For some reason, however, Boilsoft puts it back together because it does it without re-encoding it. It just does it instantly. However, mm -hmm. it does that. I can watch the video fine. I can, I can, I can read it. It doesn't import into Vegas either. Or actually, it might import into well, Vegas, and then I'll have to re-encode it anyway. Using that program that you're talking about, the Boilsoft uh, Video Joiner or Splitter, I think it, yeah, it's a splitter. Yeah. Um, you can, when you go to finish it, when you've cut the pieces, you can re-encode re it to it. a different format at yeah, that point. Yeah, and time. I think I've tried that too, and I think it failed. I might try that this time again. I just mm -hmm. got. I got fed up with trying to do it before. I think what I wound up doing is just uploading it to YouTube, let YouTube convert it, and then re-download it, and then yeah. and, and then recut it. Now, the the main reason is if it's over two hours, neither YouTube nor Twitch let you highlight and cut the full length thing. It'll only like Twitch will only show you two hours, and YouTube will just say you right. can't edit anything over two hours. So, ugh. <sighs> but you can you can highlight right at that though, right? On Twitch, if you go into your like past broadcast, you could highlight the exact section and then just upload it well, to YouTube from there. I, maybe I'm I'm doing it wrong, but when when I go into my past broadcast and I look at a video that's over two hours, it will show me the video in two hour clips. Oh right, right. So this you're saying there's a split like when you need to I have think, that all one. You know, it just occurred yeah. to me maybe I can do that. Collegiate, like Bridger and Freelancer getting married, tis tis. But I gotta tell you something, Collegiate. The day you find a girl that will put up with not you, my, does not <laughs> mind you practicing yep. for a Counter Strike tournament for like six hours a night, like for five nights a week. You better put a ring on. Uh, you better. Get her a ring as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> that don't come around very often. That's true. Beyonce wrote a song about that. <laughs> For me, it was when I could get somebody that would actually sit next to me and, and, and play the games that I play. That's, like, important. <laughs> so she, she now plays. She's more dedicated to League of Legends than I am at this point, and that was kind of. Yeah, she. I remember her, like when she was just starting, and now she's like pretty hardcore in it. She's, yeah. She uh, understands all the mechanics down pat and everything. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, that's that. that Is she gonna? She's gonna get big into Guild Wars too, too, right? Absolutely, yeah. She's she she really really wants to play the Silvari. Uh, she she loves like that's that's actually what hooked her in, and that's actually kind of the thing that hooked. She's more of a, a creative artistic person, so she loved uh, like the characters in League of Legends. Like that's the major thing that drove her to liking it because they put so much character in, almost as much as TF2 does in their characters, uh, like with the voice acting and the sort of backgrounds and things like that. She loves that about the characters, and she loves the the look of the Silvari. She really really liked that. So that's kind mm -hmm. of like I got her hooked by showing her the Silvari and explaining to her what they were, and she's like, oh, those are really cool. And that's why I got her to, into Guild Wars 2. So yeah. I 
from all the pictures, the Silvari look really cool. Plus, I mean, there's like you can turn into in the beta weekends. There was that box that you could like turn oh, yeah, into, you a turn into a Silvari. So yeah, you I'm really excited to see what they actually look like when they add them to the game. Yeah, and what kind of options? Because it looks like you've got like a really lot of customization there. You've got weird branches. Uh, you know, brown brown uh, leaf, you know, textures versus green, like summer versus winter textures. They talked about that a while back in the, when they did the, the whole Silvari Week thing. It was really cool looking. So I'm very excited to see what, um, what you call it, what, uh, what, what customization options we'll have in character For sure. Creation. For sure. Look at me. I sound like a casual. <laughs> <laughs> so casual. Cough, cough. We, but apparently our fans are are, are are pining for more casual, because we've been doing a lot of the hardcore PvP, world yeah, versus world stuff for the last couple of weeks. And now we just did a hardcore one like, if you want to be awesome and stream like us, then you have to get a better computer and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I think next week we gotta, we got to appeal more to the uh, the PvE audience or we're going to lose them permanently. So For sure. we got to do something like that. Unless, of course, next week is a beta weekend, then, uh, then we don't well, do anything. <laughs> so we have, what, Stress Test Wednesday, Stress test Wednesday. Town Hall Thursday. Well, Wednesday okay. night, actually. Or Wednesday night, my bad, yeah. And then, well, I don't think there's beta weekend. I don't think it's going to be this weekend. They never, they've never done it right after a stress test, even when the stress test was on Monday for, like, the first one. Mm -hmm. But, all right, Oku. Have a good one, man. See you guys. See you, Oku. So... I predict that there's a you know a pretty good chance that we'll see one like the seventh, the weekend of the sixth, seventh, eighth of July. Because what was the last one? The last one was ninth, tenth, eleventh, and that's one, two, three, four weeks later. So that you know four weeks yeah. is a decent amount of time. They took what five weeks to between beta one and two, and that I think was because they ran into some snags. Like it seemed well, like they were planning to do it the week before. Yeah, but wasn't that wasn't there a holiday on that day or something uh, was that weekend? It, one two three of June. Uh, I'm pretty sure, like the the month, like deadline when it came around that weekend, there was a oh, holiday. Was Memorial or Day. That's right. Yeah, the Memorial weekend, Day. The, so yeah, it was uh, 26, 20, uh, 25, 26, 27, I think was Memorial Day weekend, if I'm not mistaken, of May. Uh, mm -hmm. So to so that, yeah, that would have been. But then they skipped one two three as well. The, yeah, the beta weekend was on eight nine ten. So, I don't know. Yep. A month seems like enough time to where we might get a new build. Uh, but it, it, if it's not on the 6th, 7th, 8th, I think have it guys, almost certainly will be on 13, 14, 15. On that subject, have you guys seen that um, the, the, all the people talking about that they heard rumors? I forget the original source, but like the launch date announcement is imminent. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, the from the like Korean financial reports or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's like, right. Like so, N NCSoft's going to do their investor meeting for like all the stock people. You know, everybody that has stock in NCSoft, mm -hmm. which is a Korean traded stock. Um, so they were having this big meeting coming up. I don't know the exact date, but they're guessing that obviously, you know, to pep, you know, nothing's better to tell people that in Korea that have bought your stock then we have here you go we have a, we finally have this product coming out representing our company and so a lot of people are thinking that they might actually announce it then like ArenaNet may do an announcement uh, you know on the, on the US out of things or maybe on the blog or something but at the same time the uh, NCSoft will make the announcement for the stockbrokers um, I, I don't know I mean it has credibility to it so yeah it could be I mean they did have one of those stock you know, I think they have to do it every quarter or something. And the last time it was like, it's still on track for 2012 was all we heard. So we might just hear that again, depending upon how confident they are right now. Mm -hmm. it, it all depends on, you know, because, I mean, what we saw in the beta weekends, we didn't see the Silvari area. We didn't see the Asura area. We kind of have no idea how complete those are. Maybe we didn't see it because they're, you know, they still have a lot of work to do. And it could be, you know, September. Or maybe we didn't see it just because they don't want to give everything away, or those were just weren't quite as far as the rest of the zones. In which case, maybe it's August. Like it's 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 so impossible to know without a lot more information. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I just something. I don't know. I have a gut feeling that it's going to be soon because you're you, we're getting beyond the the threshold of where. <laughs> You know, it's it, we're getting beyond that point where okay, you're just holding out just because you're not ready yet. But I think. I think they're at that point now where they said 2012, if they don't announce it soon, then that doesn't give but a month or two before the game comes out. And I don't think there's ever been a game that gave their release date a month before it came out. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. 
Unless, you know, I'm thinking I, what? Uh, at this point, I'm thinking more like Thanksgiving or something, maybe? Or maybe a little oh, bit more. I hope not. Oh, yeah. gosh, I hope I, not, also, but I mean. <laughs> I could see a two a two month differential easily between the, you know, the, la- the announcement and the launch, in which case, you know, I, I could actually see them, like, let's say that meeting you're talking about is next week. So, like, the beginning of July. I could see it coming out in early September, if that's the case. And I think, based on the beta weekend events, I think that's enough time to polish up what they have. I mean, with the, with the exception of very few features, everything mm-hmm. in there has, is working, right? You could yeah. launch with the game as it is right now, because you do have the automated tournaments. You have the economy system in place mm-hmm. and working. As far as I know, all the crafting recipes are in there. I mean, people went through the database and pulled out all the different crafting recipes, I think. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure they've got the high-level crafting stuff in there. Uh, you know, we know that the Silvari zones exist and they're still being optimized. Can they be optimized in two months? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it feels like, it feels like it's, a, it's a race, like, uh, we have all these great ideas and we want to put them into the game. And, you know, obviously we have no idea what happens behind the scenes or anything like that. But it feels well, like how much stuff can we get in before people are like, this is just ridiculous. You know, like, uh, it, it feels really reason, polished. The biggest reason I think that it's imminent, uh, their announcement, is because you're noticing more and more answers, Bridger. And we've seen this when we talked about it. Mm. Are being answered now that we don't have, we're not going to have it out ready for release. But, you know, that's something that's on our... Like, th- that's the kind of answers we're getting very often more recently. Yeah, they, they you know, know for a that? fact this is not going to make it in yeah, right like, now, but we're going to if, address it after release. So that would assume, that psychology would assume that they know they have a deadline now. Like, they have a set time, and they know that, okay, like, player housing, you know, or something is... They know relatively how much time they want to spend on it. They know it's not going to meet that deadline. So they can definitively tell people in, like, the AMAs that... We have it on the books, but it's not going to make it in game pre release. Like spectator mode, you know, if they don't have a, I, I don't buy any more of the, we don't know when, you know, the games will be ready when it's ready because they're, they're definitively telling people like, it's, this is not going to be in. You know, if, if they didn't, then they, they wouldn't be able to say that. You yeah, see what they, I'm getting they at? have an you know? internal release date, sure, a goal, as it were, but they're, they're definitely not confident enough to announce that yet because they're not sure they can hit it. Like, nothing's worse than saying, we're going to launch on this date and then releasing a buggy mess. So you never want to make that announcement until you're really confident that what you can ship on that date will impress people. Like, that's important. So that's why if they do have that release date, like you're talking about, they very likely do have it, and they're becoming more and more confident about it, or they're pushing it back to become more confident about it every day, and it's only once they finally reach that confidence level, or NCSoft has said, we need to tell the investors something. We need to let me, something let me to ask you, them. do you think a release before Pandas or after Pandas would be optimal? I think if you've got a month between Guild Wars 2 and Pandas, that's a lot of time for people to be like, I want Pandas, but this Guild Wars 2 thing, you know, that... that but that I mean, gives... I'm saying, though, do you think it's more beneficial I, I think for them before. to launch before? Okay. Yeah. I would say before, yeah, because once you play, honestly, if you guys, anybody that's still sticking around and listening to us, if you haven't played in the beta weekends, once you actually get into the game, if you were to play the actual, like, final product of Guild Wars 2 there would be no reason to go back to WoW. They, it, you just realize how stupid it is. You know what I mean? It's like, this game, Guild Wars 2 is, you know, the wave of the future. It's what MMOs are going to be. Yeah, I, I played Terra because I, 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 I actually just tried it out like this. I, I got a seven-day free trial. I missed the open beta a while back. And I wanted to be able to talk to people who were making the comparison between, uh, you know, uh, Guild Wars 2 and Terra because I've heard people say, oh, Terra is much better because it's got real action combat, right? Or things like that. And... I, I, I just wanted to be able to accurately talk about that because most of the time I just had to say, step back and say, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I would like to disagree with you, but I can't because I haven't played it. So I played it and I decided to make a sorcerer person. So I made a sorcerer mm-hmm. and I'm running around and I'm getting the hang of it. And I really like, kind of like the little combo system they have set up there so that you don't have to have a thousand buttons. You can just hit the space bar and it'll do a combo that you set up. I think it sets up a bunch for you automatically. And I really kind of liked that system that they built in there. That was very cool. And I like the, the artwork is very, very cool looking, obviously. It's got its own aesthetic, but it's, it's definitely very pretty. Uh, different from Guild Wars 2, but very pretty yeah. on its own. And then I started getting into combat and, and, and I started understanding everything and I started trying to 
play with my new understanding of the mechanics, not just futz around and hit buttons to see what happens, but now I know what these do, here's what I'm gonna do about it. And every single time I went to cast a fireball, my stupid sorcerer would stop in place <laughs> for a like, half what? a second. Every single time. I would I was just like this weird jerky move. Like I'd be I'd be sitting there trying to cast a spell and yeah. I'd be running to the side to, like, dodge one of their stuff because it's action combat. So I'm, like, running over to the side and I'm dodging. And halfway through, like, my move to the side, I'll suddenly stop to cast a fireball and just be like, boom. Bad. It, yeah. I stopped playing after, tw after five <laughs> minutes. I couldn't take it. After playing Guild Wars 2, I couldn't do it. Yeah, Maybe seriously. Maybe it's more fluid for it, the melee It'll characters? break, like, every other game you've ever played if you actually play, if you'd spend some time in the beta weekends and like the stress test things like that like you just will be so sad when they take it back away from you because you got to go back and play these like redheaded stepchild games that you don't ever want to play again because you know that guild wars 2 exists it's really that good yeah all right i'm gonna be popping off guys gotta finish uh putting up all these posters and fun stuff do you got you know that's there's got to be somebody in chat. This is post show, so I'm just gonna throw it out here. There's got to be somebody in chat that knows a good website to get like posters. And I'm not talking about posters like, uh, you know, like paintings and stuff. I'm talking about like, you know, geek type posters. You know, like brand names and fun stuff like that. Or, um... yeah, well, yeah, I mean, exactly. And I have no shame in saying that. It's I'm looking for like. Geek nerd type posters. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I want to express myself. What about Think Geek? Have you been to Think Geek? Embrace it. Embrace it. I've nerd. been to Think Geek, but I mean, they, they seem to be a little overpriced and stuff. Ah, and I that's found true. Other, that's true. You know, and like, so I have like my portal stuff that came in. I, yeah, I got the collector's edition stuff, the StarCraft mm -hmm. stuff, but I'm looking for like a good Diablo 3 one, maybe, or a good, I don't know, Guild Wars 1 poster or something, you know, or, uh, yeah. Uh, there's got to be a site out there. I just got to find it. Well, right. I know. Kiyo, what, what is it? Kiyo Kikon? Is that the artist for Guild Wars 2? By the way, he stepped down. Did you guys read that article? Oh, no, yeah, what I read that. Uh, yeah, so the main artist, the concept artist, which makes sense because conceptually the game is done. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, there aren't the, a lot of work for him right now except maybe exactly. like expansion stuff, but maybe he's pursuing a different... Yeah, he could, he's could. he been working for him for like eight years or something like that, so he probably you know, might want to diversify some of his portfolio, which makes sense. But at the same time, you know, he does have that that driving love for everything that is Guild Wars. But um, I know he actually does, uh, you can buy some of his artwork, and that's like Guild Wars 2 stuff and conceptual art as posters and things like that. So um, there's that option. Where at? Do you, do you know where that's at? Uh, I would, he has I would a, buy every one of those. He has a main web page or a main, uh, I just, I don't yeah, have the I'll, link. I'll search for it. I'm sure his yeah. name will pop it up. Yeah, but you can buy some of his artwork too. It's not necessarily the cheapest, but it's not like going to break the bank or anything like that. If, especially if you just get like the, the reprints or whatever. Yeah. What I need to get, and I need to try to leverage my celebrity, because I have a collection of signed uh, gaming, uh, game-related posters that have gone <laughs> back for a long time now. The first one I ever got was Rise of Nations poster, like a movie-sized and styled poster for Rise of Nations, which is one of my favorite RTS games ever, by the way. Uh, it's still... I installed it, at, like, last summer and, and started playing it again. It's so awesome. But... Uh, I got that, and it's signed by the creator of Alpha Centauri and the creator of Rise of Nations. And now his name is slipping out of my head. Where the hell is it? Oh, mm -hmm. gosh. I need to go look at it. He just went over to do Facebook games, which really disappointed me. Oh, man. Some of these prints that are... Okay, so they just linked it in chat for you. For I'm the... looking at it now. Yep. Some of those are pretty cool. But you can actually... These are... This is a very limited thing. Cause it's... I think it's specifically from his store. But you can get, like, other prints of his work, too. But I don't know where to get those, either. Apparently, you can get... There's some stuff available at go. the main Guild Wars page, as well. Oh, cool. Oh, Brian Reynolds. That's who I was thinking of. So Brian Reynolds signed that, and then I have a Rise of, Rise of Nations, Rise of Legends poster signed by Brian Reynolds. And then I have a Supreme Commander poster signed by that guy, and now that name's running out of my head too. The guy who did Tonal Annihilation and Supreme Commander. Um, and then I also have a Company of Heroes poster signed by the developers from when I went up to Vancouver to Relic Studios uh, for their fan day. And then I also have a... Dawn of War 2 poster. So I'm hoping to continue that trend and mm -hmm. get a Guild Wars 2 poster. Heck yeah, man. 
We'll get signed, it signed by, by all the devs. Awesome. Yeah, oh, I found it needs this, to be um, signed like, by Colin. Of, He's my hero. <laughs> instead of just putting like the poster on the wall, like I found out that Target has uh, these little frames that are only yep. five dollars each. And That's what five, I use. Five, ten dollars, and like fifteen dollars for the different sizes, but they're really extremely thin, very minimalistic, very abstract, and they're perfect. And and you could fit like you know the posters like you get from Hot Topic or whatever in them. And, my uh, Twilight pictures or my Twilight posters can fit in. Like, oh, you know, like behind the wall, behind the webcam, I have my Justin Bieber one there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I actually have my my one from one of my birthdays a while ago. My dad took my Rise of Nations poster and got it put on an actual po like frame behind glass. So that's really awesome, and it makes my other Company of Heroes one look you know put to shame because it's just in one of those Walmart ones you're talking about. But it still looks way better than just sticking out on the wall. Definitely, I, I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I've got a link to my crazy board, four hundred dollar board game. Somebody was asking about that. There's a picture of it on the Board Game Geek. So yeah, somebody just linked fabric wall posters uh, on Amazon. I am buying every single one of them. Wait, what do you mean fabric out. wall posters? Hang on. Yeah, they're not too expensive either. Oh, those kind of things. Those are called um, uh, wall scrolls. Wall scrolls. Yeah. It changes everything. It does change but everything. That's that only twenty. Awesome. That's only thirty dollars. Holy crap! I want to get one of those signed. <laughs> I want, I want in the bottom corner. I swung a sword. Dash. <laughs> Colin Johnson. <That's> awesome. <laughs> oh my God! These Amazon so cool. has a lot of these. I uh, am going to be Diablo three one. Who are those from? Studio Ca Cavern. You must... should. Uh, can we get like the affiliate link for this? Oh yeah, uh, for, that'd be good. Yeah, I'll set that, that up for the the guild later. I'm sure some people are gonna want to buy some, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'll have to go through here because I'm a big Amazon shopper, as you guys know, and I didn't even know they had these, so it's awesome. I'll get one for Divinity's Reach. That looks like to be a cool one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see the Asuran and Silvari stuff, man. I'm so excited to get like my hands. My on. favorite. Oh, yeah. I mean, my favorite poster I have is actually it's a kind of like a reprint, um, but it's four feet tall and six feet wide it's uh, and to me it's more of like an inspirational thing but it's the Tiananmen Square uh, image have you guys ever seen that oh yeah 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 with all what, what, the, standing like, in front of the tanks yeah yeah the guy that stands in front of the tanks to protest um, mm -hmm. in China but to me that's like such a powerful image so I had to get like a, a big high quality version of it I spent like two hundred dollars for it mm -hmm. um, but it's uh it's like in my hallway going to the room now and it's incredible I love it you know what you should do? You should make a. Uh, we should set it up in World vs. World where it's like you and then like five golems in a line walking straight towards you. <laughs> and you're like holding out your hand like for them to stop or something and then make your own version of that. And then put a caption stop in the name of love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the things so, that we will create with Team Legacy. What, what oh, okay. you're seeing in chat there, I put links to this, but I'm actually going to throw it on the stream here too. This is actually a picture of my. This is the picture that I took of War of the Ring Collector's Edition. This is a wooden box that houses the book designed to look like the Red Book of Westmarch, which is mm -hmm. actually the book that the Lord of the Rings book is supposed to be. It's supposed to be written from Bilbo's perspective that is then finished by Frodo. They, you know, they talk about it at the end of the, at the, end of the whole long series. Yeah. And uh, so I made this nice shelf for it. And it's awesome. And I love how it's got this, like, evil-looking shadow because it's got a light right next to it. So on the top right, it's got this evil shadow creeping on it. It's got Elvish in the front. It's a beautiful game. <laughs> and there's some other links I have in the chat there to, um, to some more images of what the game actually looks like once you open it up. And the game is <laughs> phenomenal. I love this game. That's why I was willing to spend this much money on it. Yeah. Um, see, I, I am a big spender. Like, I've probably spent, in the last six months alone, maybe over $500 at ThinkGeek. Um, things like that, collectibles, you know, but there's things I, you know, just put on a shelf. I'll, I'll never touch them again, but just, I like having them. Um, I'm, I'm a sucker for all those little, like, uh, pop culture or geek type things, so. So here's a size reference for you, because on the shelf it doesn't look as big as it is. It really is huge. It, it, when it came in the package, Holy, that's... That's huge. That is huge. And uh, I'll see if I can find one where it's actually being played. It comes with all those trays because the reason it was $400 is because all the miniatures what are painted. The They're all hand-painted. And so let me find a... So this is kind of a better image of it, I think. This is... Uh, yeah, let's blow this one up here. So this one you can see 
uh, all of the trays and everything. And the board is actually much bigger, which is great because it's much easier to play on when it's this big because you can fit all those armies in the in the right areas. And yeah, it's, the, it's such the a only game, game you ever need, Bridger, is Settlers of Catan. Ah, and don't I even that... get me started on that. I hate that stupid <laughs> game. <laughs> and I'm with really that, good. I am leaving. I will talk to you guys later. <laughs> yeah, I linked it to the <laughs> Oh man, See I can talk board games all the time. I play tons of board games. Do you play a lot of board games, iDrafts? I do. I, well, I, since I moved from Seattle, I've lost a lot of my uh, quote-unquote nerdy friends. You know, oh, so like, yeah. um, I'm not really because uh, let me. T if you've never lived in Seattle, it's pretty much the <laughs> the, the nerd uh, paradise of, of the yeah nerd kingdom basically. Oh, so that yeah, sucks. it was I like I, Seattle, every weekend man. I had tons of friends to play with that were like you know all about certain different games. Catan was a a, a common gathering because oh yeah, I played it it's a pretty bunch easy to when pick I first up and play it. it it's, but, um, yeah. the problem that I have it with it's it's fundamentally broken if everybody knows how to win. Like, yeah. if you go to a Catan tournament, it basically comes down to turn order in some cases, where it's like, the person who wins has 10 VP, and everybody else around the table has 9 VP, and was going to get their 10th that turn. Like, yeah. that's sometimes how it breaks down when the tournament, you know, the well, final game of the tournament. Yeah, but I mean, in the friendlier games, the oh, ones yeah. that are not, like, tournament-based, you, you get a lot more... Uh, uh, not so typical play, or you know, not by the Absolutely. book. Absolutely, uh, it's way like more fun when trading people don't with know what your they're girlfriend doing. and stuff, you know, to yeah. get an advantage over someone else <laughs> or something like that. Things like that. But yeah, I mean, I do Magic: The Gathering, uh, Nerd Alert again, and stuff, and a bunch of different board games that I like to play. But those two are like some of the main ones that I used to play a lot. But like I said, since I moved, I don't really get the opportunity to. But let me pull up in my collection here. Hopefully, we can set some stuff up here in the future where we can all get together and. Uh, we can do board games online. I'd love to do some, like, Team Legacy online board game stuff. Like, Serlin games, uh, his, his games you can play online on his, mm -hmm. on his web interface in a really nice web interface. You can do that for free. I really like that. Let's see. Uh, I can do only owned games, not my wish list games, and then I can make it large gallery mode. So this is everything that I own, plus or minus a few things that I might have traded away or picked up over time. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, if you scroll down here, there's a Serlin game, Puzzle Strike. I own like three copies of that, actually. <laughs> and uh, StarCraft, the board game, is a really good game, but it takes forever to teach, and we just haven't played it forever. There's, yeah, there's the that's a, a lot of the main problems with some of these games that are, revolve around just the the learning curve of mm -hmm. getting into them. Yeah, to, to play some of these games, like especially like the, the more hardcore war games that, uh, that I play, mm -hmm. you have to either have a patience to learn from someone else, or both players or multiple players need to independently read the rules and come to the game already understanding it, or right. you're, you're going to have a bad time, as it were. <laughs> or you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> so I'm one of those, like, I have two different groups of friends. One of my groups of friends is actually composed of, like, 40 to 60-year-old guys that are, like, war gaming nerds and they we play Axis and allies and and also much more complicated like games that can take you an entire weekend if you played the full campaign kind of a thing yeah. and uh yep. so so with that group of people i'll play things like the republic of rome or uh no retreat or the napoleonic wars but with my other group of friends i'll play kingsburg which is roll dice and assign to medieval persons to get you little cubes <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that. That's is my big collection there. Yeah, good times. We're um, we're looking at setting up a. Well, I don't. I want to let the cat out of the bag too early here, but th there are talks of a very large gathering of friends, including you know all the Tales of Tyria people, Team Legacy stuff like that, to where we can get together and just like you know. Um, you know, play these types of games and really just hang out with each other and it have a fun time. It would be great so. if everybody in the, like where where are you looking? I can't remember. <clears throat> I'm currently where I'm living right now is in the in the Midwest. I'm in Indiana uh, right now, but yeah. um, I'm very uh, modular at the moment. Meaning, like I could literally just pick up and leave right now. I'm living in my parents' old house, so uh. like I'm li free rent. You know, just looking for a place to go and a reason to be there. Yeah. Uh, the um. There's two other things that I need to add to this list. But uh, the, there, there'd be a great one in the Northeast if we could get everybody to come down um, for it, and that's Kineticon. is a great one for this kind of thing because mm -hmm. they have tons of board games and they have tons of space, and it's right near where I live. So um, <laughs> that's, But we should meet up at a PAX next time. Like, there's, like, we go to PAX East every year. We go to Kineticon every year. Yeah. Um, we don't really have the budget to go further than that, unfortunately, um, as far as me and Fairana, uh, Fairana and I, I should right. say like to have another event to go to or 
You mean just like as far as location? As far as location based, oh, yeah. Okay. Plus we have a dog, so any any time we travel further away than like a day or two, like we'll take a, we'll take the weekend trip up to Boston and we'll get somebody to watch the dog, and we actually stay with some friends up there to save on money. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we had to go somewhere and rent a hotel, that that would be a pretty big stretch in our finances at the moment. Only because Fair Honest uh, just got uh, finished with school, and so she's looking for a permanent position as a yeah. teacher. Uh, so until that happens, we're we're stretched on money right now. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a good idea, and I know a lot of people are interested. So, I, like I said, without not letting divulging too much information or whatever, um, you know, that's definitely planned for sure. That's cool. I'm really looking forward to that kind of a thing. Meet up! Team Legacy meet up. <laughs> I'll bring the pizza, you bring the beer. Absolutely. You never played Space Alert then, have you? No, I haven't. Oh, man, you are missing. This is one of the most fun games. Every single person I have introduced... Or gaming buddies of mine, by the way. Like hardened veterans that were just like, mm, I don't know, looks a little colorful. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they love this game. So let me break this down for you. And the reason this is phenomenal, by the way, is not only because of the game mechanics, but because of the style of the game, because of the way that the, the, the guy who, who made it uh, wrote the rules to really teach you the game in a really fun way. So mm -hmm. you are, the, the collectively, this is a, co a, co a cooperative game, Unlike any other cooperative game you may have seen before, because collectively you and up to four other people with you are the crew of a sitting duck class exploration vessel, right? So uh, one person gets to be the captain. You can. I have the, the expansion when it comes to little badges, like you can make somebody the science officer, and somebody else <laughs> can be Scotty, the engineering officer kind of guy. Somebody else can be the, the internal security officer. And basically, to put it bluntly, your job is to sit on this completely automated ship just in case something happens. For example, uh, it, basically it takes, you're, you're, you're th th thematically, you're the crew, you get on the ship, it hyperspaces out to an undiscovered location, and then it scans that location to, in order to gain information, and then after 10 minutes, it hyperspace jumps back to base. And your job is just to be on the ship in case something happens. And of course, mm -hmm. every, something happens every single time, and you have to keep the ship alive for the 10 minutes, but this happens in real time. So what you do is you put a CD, or in my case, I just play it off of my phone. You play mm -hmm. these audio files that will basically give you some atmospheric stuff and some mechanical stuff. So you'll hear That's pretty sick. phase one begins in blah, blah, blah. And then <laughs> you'll hear... So is enemy, there like an app for it? it? No, I just put it as sound files, as MP3s oh, on my okay. phone. Oh, and I okay, choose okay. them. You have, you have, like, there are a bunch of different ones, but it's randomized mm -hmm. so that it says enemy threat approaching and blue sector and so that you know turn three and so that tells you that you flip over a, a regular threat not a serious threat and you put it in the blue sector and you put it that it comes in on turn three and then as you can see on the screen here each player has this mat in front of them with basically spots for cards on every turn and now, as this all is happening, as the threats are coming out, you have to coordinate with everyone else and basically ha have your hand of cards and program what you are going to do on every single turn. So you might say, okay, the c c threat came out on blue three. Okay, I'll go to the blue sector and fire the laser, but, you know, Joe, I need you to get down to the lower blue sector and feed me some energy because I'm going to run out by turn five. All right, I can get down there by turn six, but then you're going to have to wait to fire until turn seven. And then somebody else is, but we don't have any in the main reactor how are you going to move energy over there so you have to communicate and work together <laughs> based on the cards that are in your hand and the enemies that come out and the enemies mm -hmm. are great you can have like an enemy like stealth fighter that can't be targeted until it gets to a certain point or you get an interstellar octopus that when it gets to the end of the track if you haven't killed it it just devours the ship it's fantastic and it, it, it it's it's great from a from a gameplay standpoint because the problem with most cooperative games is mm -hmm. that the, 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 the thinker of the group looks at the whole thing on the table and says, okay, you go there and do this. What card do you have? Okay, you should do this. I'll do this, and then you do this. And then he basically plays for everyone because he just asks everybody what their cards are, and he does everything for them. And so right. that's, how, that's how some cooperative games can be ruined. This game can't have that because you can't do that in, a, in, in time. That's that the time mechanic means the guy, you know, the, you can't have one leader that basically coordinates everyone and tries to make sure, okay, you're going to do the rockets on three. Okay, good. He's going to do the rockets on three. <laughs> make sure that you fire the thing on this. But it's more general commands. Like, you go take care of the threat in Sector Blue. I'll go fire the pulse. Okay, you're doing it on that turn. I'll try to coordinate with you and do it at the right turn. So 
oh, it's so fun. And it's yeah, so hard. And then after this, after this craziness, where you've put down all these orders, face down, by the way, to start with, you, you, you can't see everybody else's thing. You just have to uh, hope that they did what they said they did. Now, uh, you flip everything back over, you reset the entire board, and you go through it step by step to find out exactly what really happened to your ship because you don't have time to really keep track of all this all you know is enemies came out on this turn they were supposed to do something but you don't have time to keep track of it so you go step by step programmatically and you watch as somebody goes oh no i hit the b instead of the a <laughs> you idiot you've killed us all you <laughs> like, realize what you've done but it's okay because i put the shields up beforehand oh that might save us just enough and so now the blue sector's taken five damage instead of the seven damage that could kill it but the five damage broke the, the 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 lift, so now that caused somebody else to have to take the ladder, which delayed their other turn, and now they didn't get to the phase cannon in time. And oh, it's so much fun! I yeah, can't even like I a great time. I can't even stop talking about it. Like that's a th these are the type of board games that you know I'm all about. You know that that's I and I hadn't heard of this until you started explaining it to me. But yeah, I'll definitely look into it for sure. Check it out. It's so, I, I recommend it to anybody that you, if you can get friends into Catan, you can almost certainly get them into this uh, in terms of complexity. Um, and it, the other thing about the rule book is it has such a great introduction. It, it basically is if you read it out loud to everyone, they would be entertained and informed at the same time. Like, this is a rule book you can literally, uh, there are mechanical sections in which you should actually read ahead of time, and then you can read the flavor text to everyone else, and it basically starts out with, uh, <clears throat> this is the, the, the class, basically everybody's in a class to learn how to be a space cadet, and the, and the announcer, the, the teacher says, we are gathered here today to remember our fallen, oh, sorry, that's a different ceremony <laughs> um welcome new cadets uh pay no attention to the previous blah blah blah, blah. and then afterwards like you, you finish the first section and where he says you're gonna go on a great adventure and don't worry nothing ever happens this training is just a formality blah 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 and now i have another ceremony to attend uh if you'll excuse me for a moment <laughs> and so it, it's it's written so well with the humor it's great i can't yeah. i always read so much of it out loud and there's one more piece i need to tell you okay so later on you learn that uh, after you do like the first simulation mission, you start adding complexity to it. Like at the beginning, it's just A and B buttons, and it's just the lasers and the shields, and that's all you have to worry about. Then they start talking about the C button and what it can do at different sectors, because it does, does something different in each sector. And it turns out on this ship, um, the C button in the main control room uh, maintains the computer, because the computer itself needs a little maintenance uh, every phase. Otherwise, the screensaver will come on. You literally have to go up to the bridge and jiggle the mouse every phase, or else the lights turn off, because the lights just happen to be wired to the screensaver. And you might think, oh, well, why don't you just turn the screensaver off? And the answer is, well, our sponsor, Corporation Incorporated, wouldn't really like that, so we can't do it, and, and it's just a wiring problem with this class of ship. It'll probably be fixed in the next class, but for now, <laughs> if you don't go up there and maintain the computer, i.e. jiggle the mouse, <laughs> uh, then the lights will go off and everybody's moves are delayed by a turn. <laughs> so... I just find that to be one of them. Like, they needed to make it more difficult for players, so they yeah. added that in, and that's just such a brilliant way of explaining it that everybody mm -hmm. always gets a huge kick out of it. <laughs> Man, that's it's some good design behind that. Like, who forgot the computer? You said you were going to do the computer. <laughs> yes, but then you said you were going to do it because I was going to go launch the missiles in time so that she could hit the laser at the same time. Oh, I did say I was going to do that. Oh, crap. <laughs> there was one time. The one C button in the bottom sector is actually... A, uh, a window because the people back at home base like to get visual confirmation of what you're scanning so you get more points and each time you're trying to get as much points as possible as if you as you make it through because you can try to beat your last score for example or try mm -hmm. the more difficult decks and try to survive and get a better score you know taking damage is negative score beating enemies is a better score etc so if you go and look out the window with the C button then then you get bonus points and if multiple people look out on the same turn you get more points and so we thought we had taken care of the interstellar octopus. So literally on the turn that it was ripping our ship to pieces and we lost, all mm -hmm. of us were staring out the window watching it happen. Oh my gosh. Oh, it, like, no! It's called Space Alert. 
Somebody in the chat was asking. Space yeah. alert. Can't recommend it highly enough. It's yeah, so, so cool. Sounds good. And the we'll expansion adds, like, uh, basically a, a level-up system, a leveling system, where you can get better and learn special things. Like, the Rocketeer can play a special card that lets him launch rockets no matter where he is in the ship. He doesn't have to be in the rocket station. Like, he can just pull out a wrench and put it behind one of these buttons and launch a rocket instead. So he gets a specialization, <laughs> and somebody else can put, you know, the shields up to a, a higher degree. The, the Hyper Navigator can like phase jump the ship to avoid damage for one turn so it's, it's mm -hmm. really cool and you sort of uh have to the only thing you do when you make your character is you write a name and then you decide whether or not to check the box that says oh, I, I i i allow cloning because if you don't allow cloning you will level up faster but if you ever die that's it you have to throw the character away but if you say i allow cloning then you can come back as many times as you want but you don't level up as fast and it's less intense so it's like hardcore mode well, if I ever play this game, you're definitely on my team, that's for sure. There's also achievements in the expansion, so you can get achievements to get points. That's what I, that's what I wanted. Is there, do you get one for opening the box to the game? No. You get, oh. achievement, you get an achievement. There's so many great achievements in there. Like, you get an achievement for finishing a four-player game, finishing a three-player game, finishing a solo game, etc. You also get achievements for, like, if you started the game before midnight and ended it after midnight, you get, like, the Night Owl achievement. If you are playing the game with, uh, and collectively the group knows more than three languages... Uh, Wait, then you get like the bilingual, like each character has like boxes that you check off as you uh, complete oh achievements. Gosh. If you com if you beat the game, if you beat a mission that has you know mostly uh, yellow uh, hard, you know because the, the 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 enemies are broken up into white and and yellow hardness, and if you get the expansion, then it's uh, sorry uh, red difficulty as well. So you 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 can try to combine them or go all yellow like we beat a mission that had all yellow that's like a big hardcore achievement if you are like the last survivor and your ship manages to limp back home and you're the only one who wasn't knocked out in one of the sectors of the ship then you get an achievement for that if you know you, if your ship makes it back without a scratch you get an achievement for that so there's so many great little things that you can like try yeah. to aim for yeah i'm gonna look into it that's probably gonna be the next one i dabble with for sure um i'm simply you're asking in chat about the frag world thing uh, that's going to happen Wednesday night, I believe. Is that right, Bridger? Yeah, that's Wednesday. what it said. There's a there's a link in yeah. the show notes too. I'm gonna I pull yeah. it back up here. I'll drop it in chat. So basically, that's the organization that runs it. It's happening Wednesday night. It's listed in the event thing for the link that we gave. It's also in the show notes, which Bridger is linking right now, yes. as you see there in the chat. So that's where you'll be able to go. Like I said, there's going to be a bunch of different guilds there to. Um, kind of, you know, tell everybody what they're all about. And since you were interested in, you know, what other PVE <laughs> guilds that are available, that's a good place to, to start, I would imagine. Yep, definitely. I like this. Somebody made this the crew of the Serenity as, like, little Firefly. name badges you can give to, uh, to, the, to the people on the, on, on the Sitting Duck class exploration vessel. Oh, my gosh. Vessel. That's somebody a whole else, other level. Absolutely. Somebody else made custom, like, <laughs> Star Trek. Make it so, number one, <laughs> is the caption there. Uh, let me see, what else, uh, there's a lot of people did really cool custom things. This is the cool glass components. I actually paid to get these because I love this game so much. This is like only given out at Essen. They gave out glass components for the energy, uh, symbols instead of the, the, okay. the wooden cubes. So right. somebody was selling theirs and I grabbed it. I was like, you know, 15 bucks. I was like, sure. I yeah, want to pimp out cool. my game. I like it. I like it a little... Oh, man. And this guy, the guy who made this game, Vlada Shavadl, so many of his games are fantastic. And... See, for you to say Vlada Shavadl, that's a tongue twister. What's his name? Vlada Shavadl. I think Vlada oh. is short for, like, Vladimir. Yeah. Could be. So, Galaxy Trucker is another one of his games, and it takes place in the same oh sort of gosh. universe. And this game is cool, and I don't really need to go into, into deep, you know, discussion about what's going on here. But uh, I really like this one. It's, it's, it's basically everybody is making a ship out of pieces that they are going to take and, and send across the, you know, the universe and then try to sell the, the pieces of the ship that they made. So here's mm -hmm. an example of a ship made. All these little squares are different pieces. Now, the, the trick is, though, all these pieces start face down in a big pile in the middle of the table. And you start with an empty ship schematic. 
basically. Now the pieces only fit together a specific way. You can only have like the two connectors with other two connectors or with a universal connector. Two will not connect to one, one will not connect to two, but universal will connect to everything. And you want to have as many guns on your ship as possible, as many lasers, because after this you actually fly your ship through hazards and dangers. And if you have enough lasers, you can overcome space pirates. But if you don't, they'll like damage mm, your the ship or they'll pirates. steal your cargo or you know, slavers will steal your crew. So if you have enough lasers, you can do that. So you want as many lasers as possible. Then you need yeah. cargo because you're going to come across things where you can pick up cargo and sell it at the end for more points because money at the, at the end of the game is the whole point. Wait, and, it's yen? Huh? It's yen is the currency? No, it's uh, credits. Oh, credits. credits. Uh, galaxy credits or whatever. So you want as much cargo space as possible. But then you're also going to need engines because the person who gets there first gets the most bonus in terms of money at the end. So you're going to need as many engines as possible. But if you get double engines or double lasers, you actually need batteries on your ship to power those more powerful components. So you need as many batteries as possible because running out of energy is the worst thing ever. And also you got these shields. Now you need shields to block specific types of, of like asteroid fields and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be thinking, you want as many shields as possible, but no. Not to cover your ship, stupid. You only need the left and right and the top and bottom, and now you're good, see? So this guy has a left, right, and he has a top bottom, or, or uh, a left bottom, a right bottom, and a top left or whatever here. So he's, right. he's set up there good. So this is actually a really good ship. You also want as much crew as possible because there's going to be situations where you come across a derelict ship and you can sell it to your crew and make some, some coin that way, and they go off and you can let them go. So, so is this one person's board then? This is one person's board. Now, yeah. it, the, the, the crux of it is everybody starts off and here, here's sort of an example of what the table might look like with a pretty face on the side. Um, everybody's got their little schematic, and the tiles are all face down at the beginning of the game. Somebody says, actually, the rule says, the boldest player says, go. And so everybody starts grabbing pieces, and there's rules at how, how many pieces you can grab. You can grab one piece, pull it over your board, and then flip it over and look at it. You can put it on your table, you can move it around, and then the rule is, though, once you pick up another piece, the previous one is locked in place. Okay, all right. So you're trying to build this thing. Now, the person who finishes first gets to flip over a 30-second or is a 60-second sand timer, and now everybody else is on the clock. So you're trying to go as fast as possible because other people might get the good pieces because sometimes, sometimes you really need that double laser that has the right connector to go in the right place. So you're panicking and trying to find it. Mm -hmm. and you see somebody else has it near his pile and you snatch it up before they do it. So it's, it's really competitive and fun. And then afterwards you go and watch your ships fall apart as they go through all these hazards. And like if, 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 a, if a meteor hits the right piece and that particular piece was the only thing connecting this whole right wing of your ship to everything else, the whole right wing of your ship falls off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, and then it ramps up. You start with this dinky little <laughs> ship, and then you build a slightly bigger ship that goes for a slightly longer journey, and then a really big ship that goes for a really long journey. Like, mm -hmm. this one that I showed you before was, the, like, the biggest ship that goes on the yeah. third stage. All right, so I'm going to stop talking, because that's just awesome. Dude, that looks, seriously, it looks like a good game. Do you have this one? I have this one, too. This is by the same guy, and it has sort of the same graphics, and it's in the same universe with uh, mm -hmm. Corporation Incorporated, and the rule oh, okay. book is also similarly hilarious to read and, and play. It's great. Yeah, that's really important just to have that available when you're starting off on a new game like that, to have something that really grabs your attention and explains everything properly and makes it fun for everyone. And uh, As opposed to, like, these are the rules, bullet, 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 with, like, the rules, and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, welcome that's to play, war go. game rules, by the way. Yeah. Jeez. I have actually a war game panel that I gave at Kineticon. It is on my YouTube channel somewhere. I'm gonna pull it up in case anybody wants to watch it. It's hiding. I'm simply. It's uh. It's not a, It's not it has. It's not on the game itself. It's someone's gonna be streaming the event. It, they're holding a town hall meeting. It's gonna be Frag World stream. Okay. We don't have any other information about it. But basically, it's. Well, it's like the last ones where they have. Yeah. Uh, someone's gonna stream it, and then you can watch it. Like for example, our guild leader of Team Legacy will be in the. It's a game. collection of, of guild the, leaders the all, all talking on TeamSpeak, basically. It's, you yeah. won't see anything except them talking on TeamSpeak, but it's the content of what they're saying that you know, adds to the... It's, it's a community thing where everybody is trying to say, you know, here's what I think we should do as a community, and hey, that's a really great idea. How can we coordinate on that? You know, that kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And state of the community, like, here's what Team's Legacy is doing. Okay, here's what, here's what this team is doing. Here's what this guild is doing. Hey, let's coordinate, that kind of a thing. Ah, here mm -hmm. we go. 
Yeah, the, you can also, can. like I said, um, our leader is going to be in that town hall meeting. So if you wanted to watch a stream of it, you could just go to our website, teamlegacy.net, and Freelancer Stream will be right on the front page there, and you can just click into that. But like I said, it's Wednesday night, and that's all the info we have on it, really. Uh, sorry we couldn't assist you any more with that. Um, all right, so good show, man. I look forward to more in the future. I'm going to head off and we grab some food. But uh, Absolutely. Can, yeah, sorry, I kept you here a little too long. I just get... Yeah, you didn't keep me too long. I could talk all <laughs> night if I wasn't starving to death. <laughs> yeah. All, all right. right. Have a good one, man. Cheers. Shutting down the stream.